Wow, you had a fun lunch. All right, I'm ready whenever you are, Jake. Great. Welcome back to season three, episode, well, welcome back to season three of How to Build a Sustainable Music Career and Collect All Revenue Streams. Uh, we're on episode six, and I'm your host, author and entrepreneur, Emily White. Huge thanks to the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment for making the season happen. This live podcast taping is part of New York Music Month, the official celebration of New York City's vibrant and dynamic music ecosystem. June also means it's, June also means it's Pride Month. I want to deeply thank our partners over at the Ally Coalition for supporting us and the crucial work they're doing. Founded in 2013 by Jack and Rachel Antonoff, the Ally Coalition provides critical support for organizations dedicated to bettering the lives of LGBTQ youth and raises awareness about the raises awareness about the systematic inequalities facing the LGBTQ population. The Ally Coalition is committed to bettering the lives of LGBTQ youth through tours, social media campaigns, and collaborative partnerships. To learn more and how you can get involved, visit the AllyCoalition.org. Okay, here we go. Today, we are focusing on setting up your release and distribution plan. Um, but to recap, you've gotten your art together, you, your pre-recording marketing platforms are in place, and you're monetizing your music before it's even out through pre-orders and, and, through, and through Patreon. We've covered, <coughs> excuse me, everything you need to know, or everything you need to do legally around your music, in particular, ensuring ev everyone in the studio signs a work for hire agreement and you have a clear process to discuss and confirm songwriting, songwriting splits. Thank you, Liquid Death. Uh, you've recorded your music and registered your songwriting uh, with the performing rights organization and song trust <coughs> or your publishing administrator. So now it's time to release your music. That's what we're doing today, setting up your release and distribution plan. Okay. So your fans want to support you in the best ways possible, but they don't know how unless you tell them. So who here has just excitedly released music and popped their Spotify link up on their social media the day it's out? The day it's out? Yancey, it's a release day for Yancey back there. Of course, everybody's raising their hand. Every artist, does, too many artists do that. So as I mentioned, We've discussed monetizing your music before it's even out via a pre-order through your website and Bandcamp or, and or Patreon to take your, your fans along on the journey of your release. Uh, sorry about that. I recommend pushing that again when your release day comes, but now they can purchase your release in full and hear all of the music, all of the music immediately for their fans. For, for your fans. I'm going to take a huge gulp of water. <coughs> I ate some chocolate right before. I ate some cacao nibs, and that's going on in my throat. So thank you for bearing with me. OK, I'll say that again, because that's, that's really important. I, rec I recommend pushing that again, so your pre-order uh, when your release day comes, because now they can purchase uh, the music you're releasing in full and hear all of the music immediately right away. So let your fans know this is the number one way to support you. And really, better yet, if you can give your community.com, your email list, and Patreon fans the music a few days early so they feel special because they are. They're your most hardcore, loyal fans and frankly will spend the most money on supporting you. So let them. Your music should absolutely be out on Bandcamp and streaming platforms on your release day. I'm not saying, like, don't do that, but it's like, what are you pushing? What are you promoting? Are you pushing, hey, give me fractions of a penny? Or, hey, give me dollars, tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars, hopefully thousands of, thousands of dollars, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So, but on day one, I want you sharing these bundles from your website, which is going to have the highest profit margins and 100% data collection from all of your fans. And then you can use that data collection, those email addresses, <coughs> excuse me, mobile phone numbers, and then you can communicate your shows and future releases to your fans directly without solely relying on social media algorithm platforms, so social media algorithms and platforms that come and go. 
Does that make sense? So I'm basically saying like push, you know, your pre-order is now the order. You're going to make the most money when you're pushing, you know, those bundles any anywhere from like, you know, $5 to digital all the way up to $100 for um, cool packages that include vinyl, shirts, tickets, all that good stuff. Like push that on day one. Say like this is how you, su su you support me the most. And as, we, as we talked about in episode two, you can build a really enticing, you know, pre-order and campaign for your album. So it's like, you know, someone thinks, oh, I'm just going to spend five or ten dollars on the digital and suddenly they're spending ten, twenty, you know, fifty dollars um, uh, more. So again, let them. And um, okay, so that's that's day one. And then on day two of your release, share on your social media and your text list that your music is out on Bandcamp. Again, it can be on Bandcamp, it can be on streaming on day one. It's just like, in what order are you sharing this information? So Bandcamp is where you'll receive the second highest profit margins and second most amount of direct-to-fan contact info for future use. Uh, more often than not, you get email addresses from fans that purchase your music on Bandcamp. Um, some of them are going to opt out of that, but most of them um, opt in. Bandcamp will receive a 15% commission on any funds brought in here, which is pretty good because that's usually, like I said, dollars and not fractions of a cent. Your website is the best because you're only going to pay like a PayPal or a credit card fee. That's going to be like 2 3% or whatever. So then on day three, share your social media and sh share on your social media and to your text list that your music is available on, on streaming platforms. As, if you, as I mentioned, as if you let your fans know that on day one, you're just encouraging them to pay fractions of a penny instead of, like I said, dollars, tens of dollars, hopefully hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. So they can't give you that money if there's no way to do that. Does that all make sense? I'm not saying don't be on streaming, but it's just like in what order are you communicating this? And it's, I'm talking over like 72 hours, you know, so it's not that much time. I know you're excited to get that Spotify link out there, but, um, you know, I, I mentioned that on a different podcast I host, the I Voted podcast, I had the privilege of interviewing uh, Seth Godin, who really invented permission marketing, which is what we're talking about. Your fans have given you uh, their permission to have their mobile phone number and their email address. That's why they are um, the hardcore super fans who are willing to give you money as well. And Seth, you know, obviously summed it up better than I did. He was like, on Spotify, on social media platforms, you are the product, right? And you know, we don't have to go through all this again, but um, they have all your fan data. They're never going to give you your fans' email addresses. They're never going to give you their mobile phone numbers. So that's why collecting that data is so important, and those are your most valued fans because they've given you that data. They're going to give you money. There's nothing wrong with the more casual fans that are checking you out on, on streaming, you know, find you on a playlist. That's all great, too. Um, but really doing right by those hardcore fans, like I said, making sure they get the, the release a few days early, um, creating really memorable experiences for them, you know, hanging out at the merch table, like signing, saying hi, we'll talk more about that in the live and, and merch episodes. Um, but all, all of those experiences last a lifetime and, and think about how you feel and, or felt, you know, maybe when you were younger in those situations as well. So that's like the, that's the A plus version. That's the direct to fan section, the, the direct to consumer section. Um, does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, but obviously we want your music on, on streaming. We want your music um, available all, all over the world, even though of course Bandcamp and your website is all over the world as well. So um, I'm gonna go through a variety of distribution options um, for getting your music up on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, all that good stuff. Um, the shorthand for that is often DSPs, um, so digital service provider, I believe. Happy Friday. Yeah, yeah. okay. Th thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so I've done the math on this, and if you are making less than a few hundred dollars a year on streaming per release, or you're a new artist and this is your first release, go with CD Baby. Um, they're going to take a percentage, um, but... Uh, like I said, I've done the math, so if you're making more than a few hundred US dollars a year on streaming per release, uh, you're going to want to go with TuneCore or DistroKid. That's going to be better for you financially, but if it's less than a few hundred dollars per release, which is a lot of people on streaming, CD Baby is going to be your friend. I do really like um, CD Baby 
um, has a lot of great services as well. I like TuneCore too. But just from a hard math standpoint, if you're making um, you know a few hundred dollars, less than a few hundred dollars per release per year, go with CD Baby. If you're making more than that, check out TuneCore. Probably TuneCore over over DistroKid. Their, their prices are very similar, and I know TuneCore is adding um, you know uh, some more features. If you are an electronic artist, you know, an EDM, a dance artist, you're going to want to go with Label Engine because that's really going to prioritize getting your music um, onto Beatport. You guys know there are, these are, all called, these are all called aggregators. Maybe you don't know that. But you guys know there are plenty more aggregator options to get your music out on streaming worldwide. But I wanted to review the pricing structures or the, you know, which ones you should go with um, based on where you're at. Um, out of the most common aggregators, and most of you know this, but you own your recording rights when you distribute through an aggregator. They're not taking any ownership, at least the, at least the ones I mentioned. I've never heard of an aggregator um, you know, owning rights. So uh, are we clear on aggregators? OK, great. Um, there's also selective distribution companies. So that's going to be like Symphonic, Red Eye, The Orchard, and there's many more. These companies will receive anywhere from 10 to 20% of your streaming income. And once again, you own your rights. And amazingly, from my, I don't know if that's a word, but um, from my perspective, amazingly, uh, they are not going to take a cut of your band camp. They're not going to take a cut of your website sales. So where you make, it, it's amazing. Again, it's amazing. The, where you make the most money, those companies, none of those companies are going to touch, right? Like DistroKid, TuneCore, CD Baby, the aggregators aren't going to touch. And then um, the more selective distribution companies um, aren't going to touch either. And you know what? Uh, well, let me explain the percentage on the selective distribution companies first. So these companies will receive anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of your streaming income. And once again, you, you own your rights. I personally really love uh, some of the work Symphonic is doing. I've had some really good experiences with them. But I've also worked with these selective distribution companies and realized that artists are making more money with aggregators. They are making more money on, on TuneCore, you know, DistroKid, the, the companies that I mentioned before. So you know, it's worth exploring working with these uh, more selective distribution companies. Um, you can also ask for an advance from these more selective distribution companies. That's one reason I've you know, sometimes advised specific artists um, to work with them. If, uh, there, was, there was an artist I was working with that needed a little more cash to finish her recording. Um, but that, you know, that was a few years ago. Now you could work with, um, if you're um, generating at least 10,000 streams a month, you can work with companies like Beatbread, and they, they will actually just give you a cash advance um, based on your streaming. Um, they have algorithms to figure out uh, and calculate and project your royalties, and, and you own your rights as well. But you can get a cash advance uh, from these companies uh, if, if you need one. I mean, that's something like we've touched on a little bit too. Like, don't just take cash for cash's sake. I mean, we were talking about that with Matt Wong yesterday. Um, if it's for something specific, right, your career, your life, you know, some as opposed to like Matt mentioned, like sneakers or whatever, right? I mean, take care of yourself for sure. You know, get yourself a treat. But I, you know, I think we know what he, we know what he means. Um, so anyway, so if you do ask for an advance from these more selective distribution companies, that might affect your distribution rate. So if they offer you 90% in your favor, 10% to them, but you're like, you know what, I need a little bit of money for whatever reason, they're like, okay, well, it's going to be 85, 15, you know, so then that, that's going to slide a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's nice to have a support system and a point human to ask questions to and pitch you to playlists on you know, this very specific part of your career. They're not advising on touring or publishing. I mean, some of these, uh, Symphonic actually has a publishing admin company, but generally speaking, um, they are just focused on streaming, right? They are pitching you to playlists. They're really paying attention to, you know, trends, new tools that the streaming companies are, are rolling out. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's worth experimenting with. Um, you can, you know, if, if one of these if you reach out to one of these companies and they're up to work with you, you can see how it goes. You can see if even if they're taking, you know, 10, 15 percent, if they have led to more streams and more money. Um, but also know that the aggregators that I mentioned before um, also have playlist pitching, 
and support, they just work with a lot more artists. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like it's worth experimenting with some of these selective companies. Compare what you you know made on a release with them, although they're going to want your whole catalog for sure, um, versus what you made previously. Um, but you know, like I said, it's like if I'm a huge artist, I'm going to go with uh, TuneCore or DistroKid, right? Because what's that, 20 bucks a year or something, and then you keep all of the money. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like don't have FOMO if uh, you're not with one of these selective distribution companies because, you know, with all this stuff, you know, with stuff like that, if it's like, if going with them meant being huge, then everyone would do it. That was a really good point, um, you know, Matt made yesterday talking about going with ASCAP or BMI. Like, yeah, one might ha pay a little bit more for HBO or a little bit uh, for film, but if, you know, one or the other paid significantly more across the board, everyone would, would, would go with it. So anyway, that's the deal with uh, selective uh, distribution companies. Um, I'm going to touch on physical distribution for a moment. Uh, you really should, uh, you can and should press CDs up because frankly they're really cheap to produce and you can autograph them and sell them, you know, sell them for more in, in your bundles, in, in your pre-orders. Um, in the forward of the book this podcast is based on, Zoe Keating shared that she actually put CDs out at her shows for donation only and she ends up making more because um, people just want to give, or a lot of times they want to um, grab a CD and, and pass it along um, to a friend and, and spread the word um, on her music. So I thought that was a really interesting strategy. And you know, we, we talked about this in episode two, but of course you should definitely press up vinyl. Um, you can do so through Gotta Groove. Um, I've had really good experiences working with them, and, you, and they only have a hundred copy minimum. Um, or you could work with someone like United Record Pressing in Nashville. Um, they have a 300 copy minimum. But as, as so many of you know, many of these plants are very backed up. So you can also work with uh, Digger's Factory um, for on-demand vinyl, and that way you're also not stuck with extra stock. I'm sure that's happened to some of you where you order a bunch of vinyl and then you're not necessarily selling, uh, selling through it. So, um, your profit margins are going to be lower anytime you do on demand, um, but again, you know, then then you're not stuck with um, you know an apartment or a room full of room full of extra vinyl. So uh, on demand can be really handy if you're just getting going and you don't necessarily have those upfront funds to pay for vinyl. Now that said, you actually should have some upfront funds and an idea on your vinyl quantity because of your pre-order, right? Um, but if you haven't sold 50 or so copies um, in your, in your pre-order of vinyl and you don't have the funds yet to order uh, the 100 um, minimum vinyl records with Gotta Groove, go with Digger's Factory, right? Um, to press on-demand vinyl um, that way as you continue to grow your career and grow how many folks um, will buy that vinyl. And of course, don't forget to sell the test pressing for hundreds of dollars, as those are very exclusive and in-demand, you know, beloved items by your fans. Now, if you end up selling anywhere in the like 200, definitely 300 copies of vinyl, um, reach out to the Coalition of Independent Music Stores, and they will buy vinyl from you directly and distribute it to indie record stores worldwide. Maybe they'll even uh, distribute it to Tower Records' uh, new website. Um, if they're not a Coalition of Independent Music Store <laughs> member, um, maybe they will be soon. Um, but the, the Sims, for short, is a great group of folks that, like I said, will just buy that vinyl from you. Um, and like I said, they're, they're usually, I, I would say if you sell 300 copies, they'll definitely be interested. You could reach out at 200 and be like, what do you think? Um, so you could reach out to Reg over there, um, who's a great guy, and hopefully um, buy some vinyl from you directly. So last thing, oh no, two more things before we bring Kristen on. Um, when you distribute your music through your aggregator or through your um, you know, selective distributor, double check that your music is being distributed on Pandora because there's also been you know, uh, kind of a backed up queue on Pandora for quite a while. Um, but once it's up there, let your fans know. That's something else you can post, maybe on day seven or something, you know, maybe further down the line. Like, hey, just a reminder, I'm on Pandora. Feel free to make you know, um, an artist channel on, on you know, on Pandora. You can also sign up for Pandora's AMP program, 
um, and make shout outs like, hey, I, I, you know, if there actually are artists named Emily White, we might start working with one. Shout out to Emily Jane White. But if I were an artist, um, hey, Emily White here, you know, thanks for listening to my Pandora station, um, th those kind of shout outs. So at this point in the process um, that we're taking you through to cover the entire modern music industry in full, um, sign up for Sound Exchange. That's how you're going to collect your royalties for, uh, from Pandora, from Sirius, and any sort of internet radio. The technical term is non-interactive internet radio, which just means that um, you can't pick the songs like you can on Spotify, Tidal, Apple, all that good stuff. Um, but don't stress, I know I've been mentioning some revenue streams as we go. Um, don't stress too much about that because we're going to do an entire episode uh, called Revenue Stream Checklist, which is episode 10. So I, I will review all the revenue streams that are owed to you. If you write music, if you record slash release music, if you play, uh, and if you play live. Um, and then I'll also share bonus revenue streams where you kind of have to go do something as opposed to your PRO or your publishing that's just owed to you, you know, once you register your music and sign up. Okay, so one last thing. Um, I touched on this uh, in the legal episode, I believe, as well. But of course, you can also sign with a label, um, you know, if, if there's labels interested, and they will distribute your music as well. So an indie label is generally going to be a 50-50 deal. Um, most indie labels will license your music, but frankly, kind of the bigger ones, the bigger, hipper ones, a lot of them will own your recordings in perpetuity, and it's, it's non-negotiable. So it's kind of ironic they're called independent labels, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and then a major label is going to be like 90-10 with the 90 in their favor. That's all negotiable. Um, it could be 85 in their favor. Uh, it could be 91 in their favor. And more often than not, they are going to require um, signing your publishing rights, your touring rights, your merch rights, your branding rights. But if you, frankly, follow the steps in this podcast and in this book and build yourself up as much as possible, you're going to be in the best possible position um, you know, to maybe even license your music to a major label or get a better distribution rate with someone like Symphonic, right? Um, I interviewed Freddie Gibbs manager Lambo, and they built his career, career up over a decade and now license his releases to major labels, which is an amazing you know, position to be in. So Freddie owns those recordings, which is pretty incredible. Okay, so we're going to bring out our esteemed guest for today. I'm going to share a little bit about Kristen while we get that rolling. Kristen Jewell is the founder of Jewell Concepts, an incubator and music marketing slash management firm for independent artists. Kristen's team encourages artists to know their worth, keep their focus, and prepares them for a high stakes and data driven industry. I love that. She's a senior analyst with Water and Music, which is a research intelligence network for the music industry with a focus on AI music, Web3, and music in the metaverse, which is what we're going to be highlighting today, really like the next phase of distribution and more. Kristen is an advisor to several startups, including Sound Medicine, Sound Medicine, a, a binaural Beats label uh, and soon-to-be app, stvd.io space, an online place for young artists to connect with their community and fans, the NVAK Collective, which is a Web3 label and foundation set to focus on fostering learning of music production with youth in underserved areas of the world. That's amazing. She prioritizes mentorship for young entrepreneurial minds with both Grammy U and Live Nation's Music Forward Foundation. Kristen resides in Los Angeles, which is why she's going to be on the monitor today, where she is not only the host of her web series and podcast Uncut Jewels, but is also an avid member of the Live Music Rocks Any Night of the Week Club. Let's welcome Kristen. Yeah, amazing. Awesome. How are you? I'm very good. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can see you. Excellent. We can hear you. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. This is so exciting. Same. It's uh, I have to say it's Navoc Collective and yes. Studio Space. I didn't They're get a chance to run with those. The Vs. Yes, I apologize. I did not get a chance to run uh, run that by you. No, you're fine. You're okay. fine. Don't worry. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. And and we didn't even get a chance to review a lot of this before. So anything I'm wrong on, just keep just Don't keep worry. correcting. 
Okay. I will. I'll totally let you know. Great. Yeah. It's so great. I wish I could be there in person. I am so FOMO right now. Like you have no idea. Although I am, I hope everybody's safe with the, uh, the fire, the, the, um, the, the clouds coming yeah. from Canada. Thank you. I was going to say, it's like, you, you haven't really missed too much this week, but we, our lungs are feeling better today, right? Like we can all Good. breathe a little bit better. So that's nice. Good. We've yeah. been dealing with this for like 10 years out here with these fires. So I don't, I totally know what you're going through. Yeah. 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 I've seen a lot of good West coast advice actually that like your lungs are better after a few days and you got to wash mm -hmm. all your clothes and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, but I definitely, I miss New York. I can't wait to get back soon. Yeah. Well, we're here. We're here when you, when you get here. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. So from my perspective, it, it looks like you didn't start your career in music. Is that correct? No, actually, I, um, I, I mean, I played French horn and I, I DJ. Those are my turntables there. Um, and I've played guitar since I was four. So like I've always had some aspect with music in my life. But, um, you know, I was a writer. And so that was the biggest focus when I went to NYU was for writing and broadcast journalism. And um, during that time, I sort of realized like, you know, when you do all those internships and you get a chance to see all the different types of work, as much as I love music, I loved advertising. Yeah. And I I just fell into the advertising rabbit hole for you know, a good 25 years uh, between client side and agency side. Most of my work in New York was agency side mm -hmm. after NYU. I came out to Los Angeles and did some stuff here in, um, agency side as well. So it was really interesting. And I just, I love the fast pace. I loved new business. That was, I don't know if you've ever gotten, I mean, you probably your whole life is new business at yeah. this point, but at that time it was a very select group of people who were being, you know, included in the RFP process. And I worked for creative agencies. So th we were always doing some really fun uh, work. It was just inspiring. And uh, then yeah. I'd say well, probably- just, sorry, sorry to interrupt. What's an RFP for those that don't know? Oh, sorry, request for proposal mm -hmm. and then, you know, information. So basically how you would handle their ad business, like they've got X amount of millions of dollars to spend. You have to figure out what you want to do with them. So I've always done plan, like, you know, there's a media plan, there's a creative plan, there's a strategy that goes into designing all of that. So I would sit, you know, as a group on top of those things just to connect the dots so that by the time it goes to the client, it's cohesive and everyone knows what the value is of the agency that, you know, we were. So if you work for a couple different agencies, you get to see how, you know, I like to call it like retrofitting a strategy, mm -hmm. oftentimes because you know the end goal is this and then you know you have these things to work with so you got to figure out how to like make it really fit and be strategic so i've i've been a strategic planner of some form in my life my whole adult career since i was probably 18. <laughs> it's crazy yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. so did you, you know, yeah go ahead i was gonna say but you know that's like the whole point to the life cycle right back then they were saying um, you know, we might have five different career changes in our life, which was like traumatizing to so many people. And I was like, well, that doesn't even sound like a lot. And now look at us, like yeah. you can do anything at any point in your career that you want, which I think is the most empowering part about being, um, frankly alive today. You know, we couldn't do this yeah. 40, 30 years ago. That was just not an option. A hundred percent. Yeah. So did you come into contact with music when you were at McCann Erickson? Maybe explain what McCann Erickson is if folks don't know. Um, well, so the agencies I worked with were really top of the, like most of them were creative. So it was like TBWA, Shiat Day, which is still around. Um, I worked in Los Angeles at the Binoculars Building, which was designed by Frank Gehry at the time. And it was really like popping. Um, we were winning back Apple. They put Apple on the map. Um, yep. with their campaign in the 80s. Mm -hmm. they, have all, they were just incredible. And then I worked for Cliff Freeman and Partners in New York. And I also worked for McCann Erickson here. During the process of working, uh, Cliff Freeman wrote um, Wendy's Where's the Beef campaign. And um, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't for Almond Joy, which I don't know if any of you've heard. But um, so music has always been a part of these campaigns because you don't do an advertising campaign without a bed of music of some sort you know, underneath it, even if it's like instrumental. Uh, so the designing of music element to an advertising campaign is 100% part of the process. Whether or not you do it before you have the strategy or after, sometimes like, I don't know if you guys have seen Lee Fields, the new spot, sorry for, uh, <laughs> this is so sad, but there's a new spot that's running, uh, it was on the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and it was for a brand, Farmer's Dog. 
don't know if you guys have heard of that. Lee Fields, who's a homie and I love him so much, he had a sync in that. They followed the entire song of his, I, I Will Love You Forever. And they had it about the family and the kid, the dog, and when the dog is a puppy all the way through. And it's like so powerful. Music can sometimes just be like the story for the ad campaign. So it depends on, you know, like I said, sometimes it's like a little bit afterwards because you don't have much of a budget. And ideally, you'd want it first and foremost where you can maybe make a difference and have that emotional impact come through. A hundred percent. And yeah. tell us about your work as VP brand director at Demosimo Brand Advertising. So after I left Cliff Freeman, I wanted, this is so honest and truthful, I'm just going to share. I really, really wanted more um how do I say this night? I wanted more autonomy. Yeah. And when you're working with Cliff Freeman and you're doing the creative and it's new business, it sort of like passes through you and then you get to work on a business. But I wanted to like be, you know, a part of a company, like actually be responsible for the fiduciary, you know, be fiscally responsible. So uh, I took this job at DeMassimo and it was wonderful. I got to like meet some incredible people. I worked with Hotwire. We did all of these amazing campaigns and it was a lot more responsible advertising wise so when you think about building an ad campaign you know there's the media budget which you usually have to have if you're doing television back then or even today you have to have more resources to do that you need a campaign that's worthwhile watching and you need to buy the media dollars yeah. when you're working at a company like Demosimo, we focused on things that were more brand direct if you will so they took the level of like my experience had been all branding mm -hmm. now we got to match that with direct which was kind of the turning point with what we're seeing today this yeah. idea of responsible branding mm -hmm. so you take the asset and you make it have legs in other areas so you get to know your consumer right the KYC so that was a really interesting time um, it was kind of pretty new at the time. I mean, I've always heard of direct marketing, but I had never actually gotten the chance to do that at radio, at TV. So our clients were, you know, like I said, Hotwire. And it was interesting, we had many other ones, but Hotwire at that time, I was living in New York, obviously, DeMassimo's in New York, and we had 9-11. And um, so that was the real, you know, we were owned by, how I was owned by six major airlines. So it was the first time I'd had a campaign like pulled from all, re everything just stopped. Yeah. So yeah, it was a, it was a really interesting time to be in branding because it taught me a lot more fiscal responsibility for what your dollars do and how you can make them work harder. Wow. Very cool. Mm. So did that lead to working with Mary J. Blige's brand brand management team? Well, 9-11 did that wow. for me. Wow, okay. So yeah, yeah how did that so happen? 9-11 happened, and you know, I, I don't know how, how many of you guys were actually in the city at that time. Uh, everybody or born, did, sorry, about a serious yeah. topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm definitely a little older. Um, we had a, um, a moratorium on advertising. I mean, every, nobody was traveling, nobody was doing anything. So I lost my job at DeMossimo, thank you, 9-11. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, I went into like, what do I want to do? What do I want to do, right? Like this is that time where no one's working for nine months. We, it was the first time I didn't have a job in my whole career. And so I decided I wanted to do music. And uh, this, is, this is where the music industry is who you know, right? So I had a friend in LA who worked at MCA Records and they had been trying to get me into MCA with Jane Simon for a while, but I was, to be honest with you, too expensive at the time. They were just, it was too much of a cost budget for them. They, you know, anyway. So now I had this chance to do some freelance work and I met with a woman through that same friend at, at in New York at Interscope. I just loved it. And she brought me in to help her with things. And we got to work on Bubba Sparks campaign, Timbaland's campaign, Mary J. Blige campaign. We got to do all sorts of stuff. And then from there, they were, it was, I was still, again, too senior for an actual role at that time. So I moved out to Los Angeles and started working with Facet Creative, which was that gentleman's company who helped me meet all these people so he was like well come it out to la and we'll just disrupt from here yeah. so that's what i did after 9 11 i moved back to la mm -hmm. and because uh, i had been here before in the 90s and i came back in the 2000s and uh yeah we just completely worked with even more married camp i mean we worked on so many things i think we did eve the rough riders mm -hmm. worked on all these different campaigns so he was a packaging guy and i got to help you know enrique iglesias work key sauce with the branding so he would come over and we would just 
go through images, Lionel Richie would go through images to figure out what the brand would look like in his packaging. We did a tour diary with Enrique Iglesias. So, I mean, he has, you know, Staples Center, huge, you know, arenas. So everybody just wanted like something. And at the time it was like CDs or vinyl or t-shirts. And then we just did like a tour journal too. So it was really a fun experience. And that taught me a lot about the creative process mm -hmm. in music and frankly, how, uh, it doesn't have a lot of money either. You know, there's just like, I went from doing millions of dollar campaigns where we had at least a million dollars per commercial to create, to having like, you know, a couple thousand on something. So it was very illuminating. Yeah, I bet. And just to be clear, I was around in 2001. It's just some of our audience are like 20, so. Totally, yeah, <laughs> no worries. It's Great. fine. Yeah. History repeats itself if we're not careful, right? 100%. <laughs> we're here to remind. Yes. So. It looks to me like you left music for a few years while the industry was shifting. Um, is B BYG Music what brought you back? And, and what did you do there? Well, actually, what brought me back, so I was at Kaiser for eight years. Mm -hmm. Kaiser Permanente is a healthcare company. And here's the real interesting part. I did not want this job. And mm -hmm. everyone knew it. But they pursued me really hard because, you know, my background is eclectic. So I took it and I thought, well, let's change healthcare. And so by doing some of that work, we had a, a small brand team inside that we ran. It was 164,000 employees. And I would have to match wits with any of them that were doing anything with branding. Wow. Branding also includes things like, you know, nutrition in their case and all these like, you know, experiences you could be building. And I was like, hey, what if we put music in every single touch that we do? Yeah. Let's start having music be the part of the brand. So we built out, um, with our team, we built out a whole mnemonic experience with Rumblefish. Some of you probably know Rumblefish now. So I hired them and they helped us work through what it could sound like as a brand. Um, and then we actually created playlists. When I would do like the Nike Women's Marathon event and think of an activation, everyone was running around upbeat music and I was like, how about if we mellow everybody out at the end of the race or we do like some kind of a you know, a yin and a yang, right? Like a, a meditative session, uh, music that lowers your, you know, your heart rate. So we did those types of things and it became very transformative for the brand. I did wow. concert series called Music Inspires Health across America. And I would see little kids come up and they're like, you know, 11, 12, 14, going to see a show. And they're like, I'm a Kaiser baby. So that was what changed my mind. And I wanted to go back into music. After eight years of that work, which was, remarkable it was innovation we designed i mean i worked with ideo and frog huge innovation companies but at the end it was the music that really connected with audiences and i thought i really want to help these artists who at the time 2005 like they had no knowledge of their worth right so that's when i was like oh i can help these people and by 2013 when I left Kaiser, that was my full-time thing. The first thing I did was try and help big music, BYG, big music. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought the platform was really interesting. But from there, I actually went and did so many, I mean, I started just managing bands at that point. And that became like a really big, frankly, that's my life, right? It's like, you want these people to succeed. So big was one of the um, one of the original reasons why I got back involved in it. And the um, man who owns that, Chris Sharma, uh, is the Rolling Stones engineer. So it was a re really interesting experience. Again, like just seeing how we can get, you know, these, everybody just wants to help, right? So yeah. that was what that was. How can we get brands to be more, you know, involved and in leveraging artists for their voice? So it was, it's still in the startup mode, um, but it was definitely a learning experience for me. Very cool. And what led you to become head of marketing at Sugaroo Records? So that was another one too, where I had, you know, been pitching Sugaroo. Sugaroo is an established, um, at the time, I think it was 20 years, 21 years of a sync agency. And, you know, when you're doing the work, like you were just telling everyone to do, part of that process is get friendly with sync companies so that they listen to your artist's music. Then that's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So Michael Nieves over at Sugaroo is a fantastic person. He gives you direct feedback and he'll, you know, he just tells you all sorts of things that, you know, like what he can do, what he can't do. It turned out he really liked one of my artist's albums, Ruby Bell and the Sulfonics. And so we worked with him and through working with Ruby, we realized she has an incredible range, even though she's a soul artist. So we started working on a platform where 
you know, you could bring artists together and do a writing camp. From that writing camp, we built out Sugaroo Records. So that's how that all became a thing. And my, all of my artists were a part of that. Jessica Childress, at the time we had that, everybody just kind of come in, hey, Mish Anderson, and we just would build out songs that were designed really more for sync. So, you know, you're when you're writing as your own artist, you know, you're writing to fulfill your own feelings and what you want to say or express yourself. But when you're writing for sync, it's a lot like advertising where you design a creative brief and you work to the strengths of what the brief is, right? So you now know you need to write it with a certain attitude, certain beats per minute, perhaps, you know, just really get in the head of where it's going to potentially go. So we did that work together and created a tremendous library that still gets syncs. I mean, it's like incredible. So it's still going. And uh, yeah, it's been really fun. I actually stepped down three years ago, two years ago, um, just to stay focused on what I'm doing. But yeah, it was great building that out. And every artist that was included has had some, some transformational study, like, yeah. like, fiscally you know financially because of it like you walk into a room with one or two other people hopefully just one other person if you're really good you come out with a fully formed song and it goes straight into licensing and within months you see and you know you get the money from it's really amazing that whole writers camp experience if you can have a chance to be a part of that and it has an outlet associated with a sync company or an agency uh, it's very valuable and wow. you get to own your masters and the publishing too. I love that. That is awesome. Yeah. So it was a very friendly experience for sure. I bet. Yeah. You've been founder and, and chief marketing officer of your brilliant company, Jewel Concepts, for over 20 years. How has well, your yeah. work evolved over this time, over this century, really? Well, that's the thing, right? It's like it went from being a branding agency, like where I was always doing like Herbalife and the branding part. And then I once I once I hit that 2013 mark, I switched it everything over to if you're not coming to me with some kind of a music component, I don't even want to get involved. Like, it's just not interesting. So that was the point where I thought, let's bring in the big musics, let's bring in all these, you know, companies that really need to figure out, you know, play network, which is an overhead real um, retailer. So they do all the music in, in, um, in Ralph Lauren and all sorts of places, you know, so it's like, I got to help advise those people on how to, you know, try and, you know, that intersection of music technology and ideally some form of branding or health mm -hmm. that's really where this started and now i'm so proud like we've been able to i honestly i'm impressed with the people who come because i'm just i'm so grateful that they're trying to do this work in the world mm -hmm. so the work that we're doing um right now with sound medicine for the binaural mm -hmm. beats um has just been really transformative for me because I've had to learn you know, so much about what the brain, it's a neuroscience piece, right? So it's just great to get to learn new things every day. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So for those that don't know, what is Water and Music and how did you get involved? Water and Music is another one of those things. So, okay, so I do obviously a lot of mentoring and I do, I love advising, you know, companies. Um, and at the time I was, it's just so interesting. I was, uh, I had done Uncut Jewels as a podcast. I was really, you know, pulling through all of these things on my own. And then I don't know, you probably have had these experiences, Emily, where every once in a while you just are like, I just need a pause. I need to think differently for a while. And so I paused in, I think it was March of last year. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I, I want to learn something new. I, I need, like the industry started feeling sluggish as you probably remember. It was like, the, no one really knew what was going on still. And it was like a lot of the same conversations we were having from 2020, 2021. So I just popped my head into water and music. I uh, had been a, it's a newsletter originally and I'd been reading it for a long time. And I don't know if like you remember when I said, like when I left Kaiser at 20 in 2013, I was like, what do I really want to do? And I was like, music technology. I did not want to leave that innovation space because I feel like it's a really important one to keep nimble and learning and moving. Mm -hmm. um, and so water and music felt like an intersection, music and technology, music and innovation. So I really thought, oh, let me see what's going on in there. And I started, you know, joining the um, the sort of get to know you's. Like everybody was still trying to figure things out from 2020. And I had met more and more people during water and music at that time. And finally, uh, there was a project going on for a Web3 Academy. 
whereby they were teaching, you know, we were kind of like group thinking what Web3 could be at the time. Yeah. Um, so it was 2021. I guess that was 2021 anyway so yeah we had the whole experience and through that academy which is the reason why water music it's a research intelligence network so it's sort of like this like learning network together you're learning and i just enjoyed the mindset of people you know from the netherlands from spain like from all over the world everyone's in this one discord group and then you know we kind of did this academy where we got to know more of each other and through that process i started thinking about where my artists could fit in and i realized many of them most of them don't they just don't fit in this space but they could eventually and what's more important is that i feel compelled by it right i see you know these are times where you realize like again history repeats itself if you're not careful right i remember in the 90s trying to explain to people what why you need why does blue cross of california need a web presence right. try explaining that to people like they literally were like what is www internet thing we don't know yeah. and they're like okay well it's the future all of a sudden 20 30 i feel the same way now i'm like having the same conversations about you know the on-chain experience about the metaverse about any of the ai things that are going on it's experimental but it's there is something here that you can see the value in. So water music became a bit of a breeding ground for some of us who just wanted to tackle things. And I yeah. was a writer and I love interviewing people and I became a moderator, you know, uh, to interview and inter you know, research. Like it was great. I'm enjoying it. I love it so much. It's so fun. But through that work, we got to do like some really interesting, very cutting or if not bleeding edge things. Yeah. So I'm having the left and the right brain, right? The creative pieces coming from all the work I do with Hamish and Ruby Bell and Sulfonics and those guys, but I'm getting to be slightly creative in this other brain of where technology exists and how you can use it and what are the fundamentals yeah. of that. And so it was really a very, um, it's been a really rewarding experience for me through that process is how I also found out about the Navak Collective mm -hmm. and Studio Space. So it's interesting to see how, you know, you're, you're hearing about things in these environments people are on the discord people are over here and then you start to realize like well there's a tremendous amount of quality music being produced like the navak collective is an incredible with with like like you're transforming the world around you as you do it everything they do is based around you know helping women and others but really i think they're very focused on women in the diaspora countries that they believe are important to make sure that they find themselves foundationally and have the education to be able to produce music and do whatever they want to do with it. So I, I kind of just got drawn into that. And again, it was all through research, like just learning about them, interviewing their founders and hearing more about what, why they do what they do. And then listening to the music and watching their artists go, you know, Annika Rose, you know, I met her last summer and she's gone from like zero to like top of the chart. You know what I mean? She's, it's yeah. all web three and they're very dedicated to it. So I just like, I guess the people in it are really interesting to me. And that that was, I mean, 100% coming out of Water and Music. Yeah, the people wow. are great. Yeah, amazing. And that's a great segue of exactly what I want to talk about next. But I just want to echo what you said. Um, you know, when what we now call Web 2.0 is kind of happening, or maybe we're, maybe it's Web 1.0, but whatever, that, that kind of late 90s uh, dot com time, um, I was in high school, I was on the swim team, and I remember like our like younger hipper coach who was in her 20s was like, what's this WWW stuff I'm seeing on like commercials and things, you know? And so I totally agree with you. It's like the stuff we're about to talk about next, you know, Web3, the metaverse, NFTs, all of that, like sounds new and weird and, and what is this? But like it will become ubiquitous where hopefully our parents are still around, but like our parents use social media now. They, they use Instagram, they use Facebook, right? They're not like, what, I mean, they're like, what is this thing about some things? But um, yeah, I just wanna echo what you said there. I totally agree. Yeah, and it, like I said, it's like, I'm so grateful to get to see this arc. Yes. Like this is the next generation of that story. So it's so true. So let's get into this, because to me, this is the next phase of distribution we covered what distribution kind of is now although mm -hmm. what we're about what what we're about to talk about is now too but it's also i think where where things are going so mm -hmm. first you know we we touched on the you know we alluded to this a little bit but 
What is Web3? Yeah, I'm well, <laughs> what is Web3? I mean, Web3 is basically a term for community. And I know that it, like, it's the new C word, right? Nobody wants to talk about it. But I, again, I, I, I would encourage you, I would encourage anyone who listens to this, don't follow hype cycles, follow your truth. Community has always been at the core of what I've done. When you're building these things, you want people to care enough that they want to talk to each other. You know what I mean? That's community. So when you're doing Web3, it's a way to take the barriers away and allow you direct access. Again, know your consumer, direct access. These are all very fundamental things. They just have a different name on them. Mm -hmm. So I think Web3, when, when I think of Web3, I think of people who are progressive and open-minded, who own their own masters, who own their own publishing, who own things and understand the value of intellectual property. It's an IP based drive. Like that's just it. Take apart whatever you want, like the, the hype cycle pieces, but it's on chain. It exists and it permeates society. So think about it. Like I have all my vinyl. I've got all sorts of rock t-shirts. I, you know, all the concert tickets. I mean, I have bags of concert tickets I've gone to over the years. In my mind, the Web3 slash NFT experience replace, could replace that and allow it to have sustainability online forever. As you know, I mean, for what it's worth, like you can say what you want, but there's always going to be some version of this because that existed way before the hype cycle, too, yes. and people were in it. So it's a matter of prioritizing what's important to you. And as an artist, I just feel like there's no reason for you not to have some presence there as long as you own it, right? Like, I'm not saying. People should be like, I don't know about the fragmentation of a song, like having ownership of a song. Mm -hmm. I would say have it be where you're like artwork, your videos, like things like that. So anyway, Web3 basically is another word in my mind for an on-chain community. Yeah. And um, can you, you know, what do you mean by on-chain? Can you expand a little oh, bit more on that? Sorry about that. That's yes. Okay. So on-chain, uh, meaning it exists on Ethereum or some form of a network. You know, I know there's like Solana and Polygon and all sorts of things too. That these networks are, uh, they can be purchased on like, you know, exchanges mm -hmm. uh, so that their value, the dollar, if you will, is a Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like, you know, it's in an on-chain experience, which means that, you know, you have 100% transparency. You can see everything on-chain. So like, mm -hmm. I have a wallet, you can see everything that's in my wallet. Like that's actually how you know if someone's really invested in this world is like, are you buying NFTs? Are you doing things with people? Are you involved and, you know, you know, in some community? Most of these things that I'm interested in um, allow, like if you will, a ticket to a concert to exist on the chain, right? On Ethereum, then you can verify that it actually is in your wallet. And that's the piece where it's like, it takes away, you know, everybody. It's just you and the artist connecting and saying, yeah, this is permission based. Yeah. So it is an ultimate level in my mind of like some sort of permission based marketing. Yeah, I totally agree. And you are really the perfect ambassador to communicate this because you've got that bag of ticket stubs, right? It's like you understand that world, um, but you know, you're- no. <laughs> I, I look at this, I have a, I have an album. I've loved David Bowie since I was, I don't even, it was 1977 when I first heard the music, 1979, I fell in love. Yeah. I have an album, photo album right next to me that is literally all of the things I ever bought of David Bowie, all of the receipts of all of wow. the vinyl and the CDs and the t-shirts over the years. I kept that thing and yeah. I cherish it. It's the weirdest thing to admit on camera, but no. I, I'm like, I wanna make those into NFTs and that's the project. You know, it's like, wow. I love that this exists because at least maybe I don't have to carry this vinyl thing around with me like everywhere. Totally. Well, we've got to get you to the Tower Lab space the next time we're oh. in New York because there's like, you know, vinyl. There's like an old uh, Tower Records like newspaper. Um, oh what do you call that? Like sand, I guess. Um, like yeah, right, the yeah uh, there's <laughs> vinyl. There's, you know, if you can see this wall, wall behind us. So um, I can totally. I'm so jealous. Like I said, FOMO, <laughs> massive FOMO today. Well, come visit, um, you know, next time you're here. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you're describing what Web3 is, that it's, you know, progressive rights holders, you know, community, that's us. I think that's just about everybody in this room. Great. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, here's the thing. It's getting a really bad, like, news yes. cycle right now. But 
I actually never liked the new, I mean, I never liked the news cycle that was coming out initially because the NFTs that were coming out were like, they're art, which is great. And I love the art. I think if you're a pure artist and you did like that painting I made, I would love to put that on an NFT. I did my very first painting. I actually made my own NFT so that I could see what it felt like because I thought, well, I can't ask people to do this if I'm not understanding what it means. And again, it's just, I sold 10, that unlocks 10 very specific experiences, but for the most part, it's just art. It's just art. It's another way to do something that we've been doing tangibly uh, in real life. So I I definitely feel like if you're gonna get started, and you own something, just test it and try it and see. And even if it's not, don't overpromise. Like people who are like, I'm gonna do this NFT and it's gonna do this, 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 and this. Mm, no, and just keep it simple. Keep it very, very simple. And frankly, like I said, know your worth. If you're designing or creating something interesting, it's just yet another way for people to engage with your merch. It's pretty fun actually. And I, And if you're really talented, at creating community and you have one that's already happening, then there's no reason for you not to do it because that's the whole point is to connect people and reward them with something that is of you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to dig in on NFTs in a second, but you know, generally speaking, how do you think Web3 will revolutionize music distribution for artists, especially those that own and control their rights? I think it already has. I think there is a tremendous amount of people like Latasha, who I actually worked with at Sugar Rose. She did a song for us and I watched her go off. And I don't know if any of you know Latasha, but she's like the queen of the of music Web3 right now. She cool. works with um, Zora. She's got her own thing going on. She's incredible. But I watched her literally go from like this artist who in Web2, she could do the things. She was making money, you know, she was doing everything, but Web3 like came and supported her. So she's she's out there making, articulating this and explaining it to people. And that is part of this process. You actually onboard your fans in your own way yeah. to this experience. And so if you look at her career now, it's like, she's untouchable. She had a career before in web two. She still does. She still earns from those sinks. She's still, no one can take away the sinks that she had. Yeah. And you can always see the spikes in those numbers on the traditional formats. But on the other side, she's become an innovator. And also she inspired gen, uh, the whole new generation of artists you know, just to try and to experience things and to commit to it. So I'd say she's the perfect example of someone who, you know, like I said, I've watched her go from web two to web three. And now she's just, I mean, she's everywhere. You wow. should really look her up, Latasha. She's incredible. I will. I'm excited to learn more about her. Yeah. Um, she sounds like it'd be a perfect artist um, to use smart contracts if she's not already. So she is. Oh yeah. 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 So so you what have to are... use a smart yeah, contract ahead. when you're on when you're on chain. You the only way to do that really is a smart contract. So you have like each of these. Um, when you're releasing, so as a distributor, if you think about like um, the Sound XYZ is probably a great, you, I'm sure many of you have probably heard, if you haven't heard of Sound XYZ, you should check it out. Um, and you can check out my uh, my um, gallery on there too, because it's really fun to see who, what you buy and who is purchasing, you know, the music files. But anyway, Sound XYZ is a, they're there are so many of them out there now some of them are curated some of them are just you can put your music up on there just like your dsp most of them though when you're getting involved in it you would want to create a sense of presence before you launch so it is like a traditional thing you just start going you know you start the build ideally you let these people know about the music before you let them hear about it so like like you were talking about when you're even releasing to the DSPs, having like a little kernel, like a little nugget for people to come and join you beforehand, the real fans, that's probably the best gem of a Web3 experience is people Mm -hmm. can actually do this before you can even be a part of a, you know how they have like the pre-order campaigns on Web3 now, you know, each of these distribution networks, they allow, not not the regular DSPs, let me be clear, Sound XYZs and those Zora and all the things that do art and music. You can actually have a tier that's just for people who have previously purchased something from you. So it is unlocking, it's amazing. Like you, you don't have to, I don't have to wait for everybody. I can get it and own it first. I can comment first. I can do all of these things that I like to do before anybody else can. 
Talk about taking care of your super fans. That's incredible. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's exactly that. I love yeah. it. Um, so just to slow down for a second, what are smart contracts and how can they benefit artists? So a smart contract is typically, I think now they're written into backends of these platforms. So you just, usually you're using what they have, but if you own your music, like if you're part of something and you wanted to put it into, um, you know, another sort of, if you will, collective, then you work on a smart contract with them that actually identifies who owns, who owns what. And I mean, it's all then goes on chain. Once it goes on chain, it's indelible. You can't change it. Like it's just, it's literally ownership identified on chain. That's genuinely what it means. And when you're looking at smart contracts, uh, if you go to Water and Music, we have our own that we've created. That's like a template, Great. and it sort of identifies areas that you should be paying attention to. And there's always something like any legal term. You know, you always want to take a look at it, or at least have someone else take a look at it. Yeah. But I'd say those are the ones that you know, if you can modify it. Um, Oftentimes, although in the future, I think it's it's still there's still people who are struggling with this actually happening because the platforms don't enforce it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can identify that there's resale value for people, right. right? So a smart contract allows for the next generation. If this song is sold or your portion is sold, you know what happens then. Um, you know it is very interesting enforcing that, and I'll just say that I'm not an expert at it, but I know I've seen challenges in the resale market. Um, like I said, if the platform doesn't support that, it gets a lot harder for the artist to really make sure that happens. Um, so you just have to watch out. But I, you know, it's tricky. I've actually never, I think I only resold one thing and it was because I got such a crazy offer on it. I was like, well, if you really want it, I have three, you can have one, yeah. you know, kind of thing. But I've never resold my own. I buy things because I like them. Um, and then sometimes I gift them to people who I feel like should really get in, in the space. Like I think gifting an, uh, an NFT or any kind of music experience, vinyl, whatever, t-shirts, they're great to do. But I would say just smart contracts get a little tricky in, in just knowing, like if you're trying to make money off of the resale, it can get a little complicated. But other than that, I think it is a really good experience, just exact on chain knowing that you definitively put something out when you mint something it goes on chain yeah. that's just how it goes so it exists for forever on chain yeah on that ethereum address until it moves to somebody else's address and that next move is where the question is am i getting a 10 percent cut of when it goes when you buy a vinyl you don't get the 10 percent cut of when it goes someplace else it just yeah. goes out so i feel like there's like a little bit of a tension there is a lot of tension actually in that resale space yeah, or, or like used books too. Same thing. Every yeah. time a used but think book about it. When you're buying an, may I talk about the NFTs Please, now? Please, yeah. So like an NFT often is like you know a really good case example of that. Like the Navak Collective does these NFTs that are also a, like allowing you to go to the concert that the artist is having. So you have this NFT. You get on a list. They show the the code at the door and you walk right in. That's amazing to do. When you're thinking about some of them come with vinyl. That gets a lot harder, right? Yeah. Like once the person gets the vinyl from the NFT, how do you ensure that that next person who purchases the NFT actually gets that? So it's like a little complicated in that resale piece. But I think the bigger point to the NFT is the reveal of something unique and unexpected for fans. And that's just something any artist can decide at any point. Hey, if you're holding this token or you're holding this NFT, you now can come to my concert tonight or in four weeks or whatever it is. So it's like these pieces exist and you don't have to do anything as a fan. It just comes to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say on smart contracts really quick, like I, you know, it sounds like an artist like Latasha would almost be perfect who's landing sinks, right? And kind of the more, I feel weird saying traditional, but current music industry mm -hmm. but then you know we've talked about like songwriting splits right and so i was yep. i was you know taught you guys how to have a conversation decide on those songwriting splits and then like throw it in an email or jessica co-signed you know you can work uh work with co-signed to put your splits in there and what i'm getting away from is like there are definitely still people that will tell you to fill out a split sheet like literally a piece of paper and sign it. And I was like, well, what if you spill water on it? What if there's a fire or whatever? So I, I just feel like smart contracts are so useful for that is what I'm trying oh my to God. say. 
Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, we all, you know, most people don't even sign those split sheets. It's right. just a sort of digital experience afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, even if it's digital, any in an email, it still holds up. Most important, though, just so you know, is your publishing is going to figure this out. The royalties on the back end, like yes. that can't get, you know, it doesn't go away. But I would say, yeah, um, she's perfect. Everyone who has something, you know, like I said, intellectually IP oriented, you know, it it's just it's a smarter way to do things for sure. It just requires a particular partner, right? Yeah. So not everybody's there yet. Yeah. And I think that becomes, um, yeah, like how useful can it be for everyone? You have to really be in the space and know your, know really the parameters of it. Yeah, and wouldn't it be nice if like the performing rights organizations were on the blockchain? Well, they're <laughs> not contracts. happy about this because they're basically not part of the process and yeah. there's a lot of people who are not part of the process labels you know they really don't like that you know it's like very um yeah there's a lot of tension there there's yeah. a lot of tension and i think that they need to figure it out you know pros are really interesting because mm -hmm. you know at some point imagine if the whole of the you know the music experience went to an on-chain experience you know world it does quite you do question like what's that what, what are they collecting on? What are they doing for us? You know, because yep. you don't really need it as much, but you know, the future is very long. So I would say just be everywhere, right? The yep. diversification of your music is the key right now. Just make sure, you know, you're not just like a stock market. Like you're not just in one thing. You're trying to do as many as you can. Yeah. And, um, totally agree. And I'll just say too, it's just like, Imagine, you know, you co you're an ASCAP writer, you, co you happen to co-write a song with a BMI writer, you decide I wrote 60%, they wrote 40%. Um, well, what if they accidentally put in 30% and it's just a typo, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know why you'd wanna, but whatever, I, everybody makes a mistake. Yeah. So that's, what's, would be, what, that's what would be so nice about having all the songwriting splits on smart contracts, because like you said, it's transparent, everyone's on the same page, because those typos, it could be your man, I mean, I love managers, I was a manager for a long time, but it could be a manager, it could be an intern, whatever, makes one little typo in registering yeah. your, your songs with your PRO and then it's and then that can be tied up for like 18 months or something so I just feel like there's so many practical applications for this stuff oh there's so many I mean look I'm not gonna lie I've lost a couple couple ETH pieces <laughs> just from like bad moves that you're just like oh wait I sent it to the wrong address so be sure mm. to be sure to check on the addresses when you're sending things to money wise but yeah the smart contracts are like I said foundationally they're where we should be moving to I don't see any reason why we wouldn't have them for everything we do mm. even if you can't access it with other partners just to have it there you know like it somebody should get it on chain I yeah. think it's a good experience yeah and you can create good habits now, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I don't PayPal someone without copying and pasting, well, first confirming their email, that uh, what their PayPal email address is and then copying and pasting it. Because if you send, you know, if you have one letter wrong and it goes someone else, you, oh, you yeah. don't get it back. Yeah, you don't get this back. So yeah. get in that habit, you know, for your for your smart contracts. As well. And go to Water and Music if you if you if you guys have access to it. I mean, there's definitely the smart contract there, but you could even like look. I would say too, like think of Sound X Y Z. Just look and see because they probably have a lot of um, uh, resources and templates yeah. for people to follow. It's just once you get it, it's the find the one that works for you and use it. I love it. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So you've touched on NFTs. Um, for those that don't know, what's an NFT? A non-fungible token. Um, and you must be hiding under a rock if you don't know <laughs> what they are. <laughs> well, we do have listeners in 140 countries. Um, okay. I'm just saying a, it's made so yeah. much news that it's almost unbearable. Like, yeah. I think that's the problem is like, it's just got such a silly hype cycle around it. But right. stay focused. Stay focused on utility. Yeah. As a manager, you focus on utility. What are right. we doing here? You know, like, how can we unlock unique experiences? Oh, also, Web3 and NFT, not about scale. Yeah. It's not. It's about sustainability, but it's not about having millions of fans. It's about literally like hundreds, maybe a thousand people who you really know are going to show up and be there for you. They're part of your team. I did this research project with Water and Music, and we met, I met, we just released it in January, mm -hmm. February. Um, and I met uh, and interviewed 22 fans in the Web3 experience and what their experiences were like. And at the end, all 22 fans and sub subject matter experts 
The one reason that they got involved is because they love the music of the artist. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that they want more of, guess what? The music from the artist. So it's just like, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, it's about the music. Make sure you yeah. do really great music, involve your, you know, what we learned is like, when they buy an NFT, it's yeah. kind of um, a bonding experience between you and the fan, right? But it's also a bonding experience between the fans once they get into your Discord or they're on your Twitter space or they're in the private chat. They connect, they're talking. They're like, hey, when are you going to the next show? Or what are you doing here? Or can you meet up here? That's the community value. And that's why I am a believer in it. Even if it's small, it does matter because I mean, for what it's worth, when you're building these you know, emerging artists and independent artists, you just want people to show up. Yeah. And if you have you know, 10 people telling people about it, it just cascades outward, right? Yeah. They're not gonna always be there at the same time, but it is a really interesting experience to have people genuinely there because they want to build with you. Mm -hmm. And that's where community moderators come from. That's where all sorts of sales come from. I mean, it's just like, you know, referral programs. I mean, this, this is where it becomes more like a marketing experience, but it's not like, hey, buy my music. Hey, buy my music. Hey, it's more like, hey, I've got this. If you're interested, here's what I'm doing and I'm only releasing 10 of them. Or you can mint for today and that's it. You know, it's like these idea, the idea of scarcity is a really important one in Web3. And it can actually hold a ton of value for people who just want to say, they, I mean, it's bragging rights. Like I said, I've got these tickets. I've got these photo albums. Some people are like me and they would just maybe want to have it in their wallet. Yeah. And can you give some, some, practical, some, some practical examples of NFTs? Because, um, you know, we have listeners in developing countries. I, I hate to put age on it. We have young listeners. We have older yeah. listeners. So um, I know, like, we, a lot of us take for granted, you know, what an NFT is. But if you could bring that to life a little bit. Yeah, so do you remember what I was talking about, the Navak Collective? Um, if you look at their site, NVAK Collective, mm -hmm. um, they actually, they have a foundation as well. So it's a it's a label and a foundation. The foundation is the giving back and the diasporas of the countries, which is phenomenal. And if anybody has a chance to check it out, I think you should and submit for anything that you feel you might need help. They support mental health, uh, you know, gym memberships, all sorts of things that you can that get in your way of being healthy mm -hmm. um, and being able to be creative. The second part is the label. And with the label, what they've been doing with and one artist in particular, I think is really smart. Um, they've actually working, Annika Rose, she, I said it before, she's had, uh, she's been, you know, they withhold all of her shows. She didn't have a show. She just did the web three thing, just showed up, just talked about her experience, talked about her experience, talked about her experience. Every time you would see her talk about the experience, she would say, now you can download my PO app, which is a proof of attendance protocol. Cool. I'm not sure if any of you heard of that before, but no. there's literally a website called POAP.XYZ. Yeah. And yeah. anytime, like if someone was in the room with us right now, you could go and download the PO app for it. And that proves that you were there. What it also does is reveals you for unlocking on an allow list later. So, so I see her talk a couple times, grab a couple PO apps, then she releases a single. But because I have that PO app, I'm on an allow list. So now I can mint for free her very first whatever, right? Or maybe I mint her song or a music video or a portion of a music video. And as you collect these things, the more you collect, the more up that list you become, right? So then you get to say, oh, hey, like you collected this one thing, they call them like the golden eggs, and you get this very special experience. It's only designed for you. Yeah. And that's something that the artist decides that's what they wanna do with you, which is really a pretty impressive experience because it's so one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it's literally one of, right? Yeah. So then after the, these are just like ideas. You could also have one of those NFTs, you show that you own that, or you show that you were a part of the process and you walk into a show without a ticket, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, they'll tell you in advance which PO app or which NFT you should be unlocking. And that's how that goes. Sometimes there are things you could do where you purchase like three or four of different things, like one, two, three, four of a series. And once you do that, you can then burn those to collect the top one, right? So it's like you per you got these four things, but th them combined unlocks this bigger experience. So there's just 
heaps of ways, like, I mean, literally anything your brain can think of, you can explore. And I'm, it's just, it, it's like the old school fan, you know, experience back in the day when you would get like, you would write a letter, like David Bowie would write you a letter back or whatever. I don't know, you know, like there's always sure. fans experiences. If you look at uh, bands like the Grateful Dead and Fish, their entire career is based on just the fan experience. Like, you know, it's just, for for decades, there was nothing. There was no way to know where they were, and yet fans were telling each other. So it's just a matter of getting people to talk on your behalf, and that those NFTs start saying like it's. I once worked with TiVo, and her whole marketing campaign was, "Look what my TV can do." And your neighbors are like, "I need a TiVo. Yeah. I need a TiVo." That's what's happening here. Oh, I want an NFT. I want to be a part of that, yeah. and that's how you hook them. And, and then I, you keep them by just being yourself. You don't have to do anything else. You're not on stage all the time. You don't have to, you know, I mean, there are some artists who do really like that. There's a woman named Violetta Zeroni, who she holds daily Twitter spaces with her people just to talk about music and what she's up to. And then they're all talking and doing things too. She's from Italy. So it's very interesting. If you really want to go deep on it, you can. But if you just want it to be, a little bit more that you're, you know, you you put this out, your audience actually is supportive of you and they're willing to purchase these things. It can be a really great just direct exchange with uh, a fan. It's so true. And I really want to reiterate what you said about, um, you know, Fish and, and the Grateful Dead, like whether you're into that kind of music or not, like um, that you can learn so much from the jam scene. Like I, I don't listen to a lot of jam music, but I was schooled by jam management companies and I was really taught, um, you know, to build businesses around artists and take care of fans a very close second. So, you know, um, I'm gonna use the word hate, like press tends to hate you know, jammier bands, but then they'll sell out multiple nights at Madison Square Garden. How do they nights. do it? Yeah. And it's all, it's all about taking care of the fans. Like I, I worked at a really innovative management company uh, in the early 2000s called Madison House that um, literally had its own travel agency for artists and fans. And that's what developed like jam cruises and, and Bonnaroo and um, really sprouted, you know, all the major American uh, festivals that you see now. In fact, maybe we can get into that with Peter Shapiro, our guest on Tuesday who produced... Um, the Grateful Dead's uh, 50th uh, anniversary show at, at Soldier Field um, in Chicago, right? Like at a football stadium. So I think there's even a book, like everything I learned about marketing is from the Grateful Dead. So um, I, you know. <laughs> there's definitely lots of books about that. Yeah, Peter is a legend. He's, yeah. I mean, he's been around as long as I have. I remember, I think he started one of the uh, 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 places I used to go to in uh, New York. But you're right. Yeah. And there's actually another book, mm -hmm. All I Ever, uh, all I ever needed, I learned from fans. And it was nice. like, or I learned from fan, yeah. So it's like yeah. the fan journey. These, these, This is the point to it, right? People yeah. talk, this is why I did the fan journey article. And if you have a chance to read it, it's a very dense one, but there's a lot of really interesting experiences in that from fan perspective. Yes. And the, the reason I wanted to tackle that was because everyone's talking about it through the lens of the musician, mm -hmm. right? Or the platform. Yeah. But the person who's buying it is having a unique experience. Yes. And that's the piece where it's like, when you start to understand what, what you're bringing to their world, mm -hmm. you can get a better relationship going with them because you, you're both in this together. And it is a really, I don't know, just it like lifts off all the pretension. And, yeah. you know, it's sort of like the behind the scenes, the peek in the camera, behind the camera um, from like, you know, you know, Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. It's like they're, they're you're just talking at people. Yeah. This is different. This is more intimate. And I, I'm really a big fan of it. I've always felt very connected. Jam band scenes are interesting. I've seen a lot of them over the years. I'd say, you know, Taylor Swift has an incredible fan base, clearly. Mm -hmm. There's so many, I mean, people who will just, I'll never miss an Erica Badu show. Yeah. Never. Like, ever. You know, because it's it's the fans, Black Crows. Black Crows fans are crazy, they're fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's what you wanna remember. It's about the music, it's about the experience. And if we can't be there in real life, this is a chance for us to at least connect offline. So, I mean, or online. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, so, yeah. you know, you, you alluded to this a little bit, but NFTs kind of got a bad rap for a while. I, I think that, I feel that is shifting, but kind of got a bad rap uh, for a little bit from many fans in the industry as kind of like a cash grab. 
However, yeah. I feel with any new technology, and you know, you've definitely shown this, how artists use new technologies is what leads to success, not necessarily just the tech itself. So, yeah. uh, you know, what are some other examples uh, of artists uh, both creating and using NFTs in a creative way? Oh, I mean, I, I feel like the the music video piece alone it was kind of astounding. Latasha sold her music video on a, as an NFT. And, you know, it, I mean, it, she also sold one at Sotheby's. Uh, it was just amazing. Like they just did a whole thing where they had an auction on things there. So, you know, it's like to think about it, it's like the very first time as a manager, someone on a platform asked me to give them our artist's video so that they could put it on their platform. They were going to monetize it. And I was like, no, sorry, it's ours. I don't care. We're not, no. So we put it up ourselves and then they could leverage it. But most of the time, you know, people get, artists get pushback a lot on some things because they don't know how, you know, well, the platforms know how important ownership of content is. Yeah. Artists think that they're just putting it out. So when Latasha decided she wasn't going to put her music video out until she did it as an NFT, mm -hmm. I was like, this is amazing. And then when she released it, I was like, I mean, she made very good money off of that. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was the highest price at the time of an NFT being purchased. Yeah. So like, if you think like, again, you're creating these music videos, you're creating all of these assets, why not put them on and mint them? Why yeah. not just see who wants to own it for real? Like, you know, even if it's free, yeah. Again, sometimes you put something up, it's like a 10 second, whatever. You'd have put that on Instagram anyway. You'd have put that on TikTok yeah. anyway. See what it does. And if someone wants to own it, try to do it before you put it up, yes. right? So it's like ownable. Other uses that I thought were really interesting um, might not be like the most, uh, sap, like I don't know, sexy, I guess. Mm -hmm. But when you lyrics and you're writing something down and you're like putting things out there, you know, having some kind of an experience um, I saw like white papers being uh, made it minted, if you will, right? So you can mint your thoughts, mint your tweets, you can mint all sorts of things. Like this is that's the whole point. And then those things you get to decide if it means anything. So you know, obviously, the more rare it is, the more expensive it would be for people to purchase it. But you know, I always tell people, and this is what Novak Collective did too. They didn't charge anyone for anything for the first six to eight months. Yeah. They just didn't. They did it all for free. They put it out. They're like, you meant this. They minted. People minted. It's just giving back. Then you ask for something. Don't right. ask for it initially. Give back. Give a lot back. Give more than you get. And that community is going to come to you and be like, here, we're going to lift you up when you release yours too. And that is that. a really big piece of, you know, when you think of utility, it is about how do you drive community? How do you bring community together? These things are identifiers for community. Yeah, like do something cool that you might want as a fan. Like maybe this isn't cool, but like, okay, there's going to be some unique exclusive message for me or from me like in this, right? Kind of like when digital music started, maybe you give away a track and then hopefully they buy the album on iTunes or whatever. Um, yeah, and your podcast, you should be minting your podcast. I mean, right. for what it's worth. I don't know why you wouldn't just... <laughs> Be like, I have this episode out, yeah. mint it. Sure, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I've, we've done Twitter spaces and people have done that. It's mm -hmm. just, it's really just a way to badge you've been there, you know? And again, I, I don't, you probably wouldn't guess this, but I'm number, I'm in the 1%, the top 1% on Spotify of listeners of Little Wayne from the very beginning, me. And no one knows this yeah. except me because I got a little note from Spotify saying you're a one percenter for Little Wayne. Shocked me. I had no idea, but I love him. So it's like, wouldn't that be nice to be able to say, hey, random, whatever. Yeah. I'm these things. This defines me as real, not right. just me talking, you know, my behavior. And then for Lil Wayne to also know that and be able to contact you or reward you or for the one percenters, right? 
Right, wouldn't that be do. amazing? Like, I mean, this yeah. is where labels fall down big time, Correct. you know, because if you're not involved in the space, you don't, you miss out on these opportunities. Yeah. Are they money makers? Probably not. But like, you never know, there might be some fans in there who are really willing to do something crazy, which is why that hype cycle got so nuts, yeah. right? I don't like, I don't subscribe to things just because of the news. In fact, totally. if, you, if I hear it on the news, I'm like, dismiss it until I have my own experience with it. And I can tell you what is relatable for yeah. it. That's why I can speak so authentically about this. If you take away all of that bad rap, you know, the pudgy penguins and the, you know, what all the, the you know, Kingsman, they, this, the crypto punks, which I'm not sure if any of you heard of, that's one of the things that I think, you know, there's a lot of people who own these and they had a lot of money in them. In the beginning, they were free, right? So now all of a sudden it's a hype cycle around it. Then they built a band out of it called Kingship. Kingship. And everybody lost their mind because they were like, well, these are who, what? And I'm yeah. like, well, think of the gorillas. Like the gorillas totally. were, they were people behind the scenes doing stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really not that big of a deal. The, the news cycle just needs something to talk about. Yeah. So focus on you, focus on your use case, focus on your fans and figure out what would be interesting to give to them. What's within your ability to give to them without having to, you know, break the bank or create a whole other work project for you. There's tons of things you're doing already that you could just make very special. Yeah, and it's so much of what we've talked about, except you're applying it in such a modern way, right? Like focus on you, focus on yourself. That's getting your art together, right? Like that's finding your authentic self. Focusing on your fans. We talked about pre-orders. We talked about Patreon, right? And mm -hmm. also like what you're totally describing with hardcore fans is what we talked about at the beginning of this episode, right? Like instead of just like, okay, day one, my Spotify links out, yay, right? Like yeah. building something really compelling. So they want to give you, I keep saying this, tens of dollars, you know, hundreds of dollars, hopefully thousands of dollars. Like that's, that's what we want. So it's all about taking care of those hardcore fans. And, you know, with what you, you know, um, mentioned with press to tie that back in the jam world for a second like you know i've worked with art, like super hip indie artists that get the most press you can ever imagine ever um but then can barely sell out the mercury lounge here in new york city even though selling at the mercury lounge is awesome don't get me wrong but that's like a 200 yeah. capacity venue right but like i said right. then there's those jammier bands that like press literally like loathes and i run a nonprofit called i voted and we work with all different genres and my our, pub our super hip publicists will be like, take out those big jam bands because like, you know, press doesn't like that. But again, they're the ones selling out five nights at, at Madison Square Gardens, right? And so it goes back to like taking, you know, creating great art, taking care of your fans a very close second. Totally, yeah. I mean, and look, I, like I said, you got to know you who you are first. Yeah. Those jam bands make a lot of money. Yep, 100%. So. Yeah, yeah, the jam band management company I was schooled at, um, I don't really like the word aughts, but it is what it is, like in kind of the mid aughts, like that's when everyone was getting laid off from labels. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I work here because like we're just selling tons of tickets. And uh, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not getting laid off anytime soon. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, are you kidding? One of my, one of my very good friends from the 80s uh, who had hit in the 90s is yeah. John Popper with Blues Traveler. Nice. And I mean, everybody knows run around. I don't care that the bought, hook bought them a, a house. You know what I mean? It's like, these guys, they started jam bands, spin yeah. doctors. Dave Matthews got his career because of John Popper. So yeah, it's pretty, it's a big world. But you know, for what it's worth, it doesn't even matter what music you're a part of. Like sure. electronica does very well in this space. Yep. Hip hop does really, really well in this mm -hmm. space. Rap, gigantic like yeah. i'm not sure you know for for what it's worth the reason i also wanted we did another project about music that's not you know hip-hop and electronica and there are a lot of artists that are you know like i said that violetta zeroni like she's a like a classically you know oriented singer guitarist singer songwriter who's got heaps of followers and she's just a lark she's been in movies now she's doing all this stuff she's very yeah. funny again it's kind of almost like a way to, you know, you'll always do the, the DSPs, right? I'm not saying don't, but it's a way to just be, have fun with you, right? What do you want to be doing and, and enjoy that more. And if that, if it's, if it's your vibe and you're already hosting Twitter live streams and you're already hosting, you know, TikTok live stream, if you're already doing anything on Instagram, like just start trying to see what it feels like in this new space. It's so true. I totally agree with that. We're not saying don't be on Spotify. We're saying like combine these things and take care of your hardcore fans because again, that's 
we're going to get the most money and diversify. Um, yeah. And then I don't know when we want to talk about AI, but there's another diversification piece there too. Sure. But, um, you know, before we get into that, you know, you've, you've mentioned a Novak collective a little bit. Um, can you tell mm -hmm. us more about that work? Cause it sounds incredible. Yeah. I mean, honestly, their work has been so transformative for so many artists and you know, they're, what really, it, I guess I just admire the foundation piece of it too, yeah. right? So it's not just a label, it's a foundation. Mm -hmm. um, my background at Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente is an actual, like a, two thirds of it is a nonprofit. And it's, if it weren't a nonprofit, it would be as large as Coca-Cola and would rival them, right? That's how big it is. Wow. Nonprofits are really interesting. Foundation work is very interesting to me. I feel like if you look at Warby Parker and Tom's, these are brands mm -hmm. that are, doing something with what they're earning, right? Unlike some people, you know, the world, uh, Jeff Bezos, but anyway, they do so much good, you know, that they're like, it's like a one in one, right? Yeah. I love the idea of what Navak is doing because they're, they're out there going to the areas that they service, working and finding people at these local levels to identify talent that is struggling, right? They're there, but they're not able to learn. They don't have access to computers. They don't have logic. They can't go to a studio, but they have these, you know, abilities, these capabilities. Yeah. So it's really just a matter of going in and spending time with them and then training them and teaching them behavioral things. So it's like, again, that's the part that I'm probably the most impressed with is just that how the foundation fuels finding talent as well, right? Yeah. So they are providing mental health, they are providing services for, you know, like I said, the gym, the nutrition, uh, you know, it, lessons, learning how to, you know, like I, like these computer technology pieces that are really, really complicated in some markets to access. So then once they find people, they, you know, they do host writing camps and doing all sorts of really interesting things with each other. And then there's three artists that they've taken from that, um, Rosalind, Talia, Lude, and Annika Rose, and those three artists are actually representative right now in the label side. Nice. So when you're, when I was talking about Annika, she's still working through, they just released an entire gamified world. Talk about, I mean, like they brought in people, they have partners um, from all sorts. I mean, we're, I'm a, I'm a foundation partner now too. Like, it's like, okay. we all want to help. They brought in a, a person who actually designs games um, and, uh, is a director and has done a lot of CGI work on movies as well. So now they've created Annika Rose's bedroom and her bedroom is the new experience point for people who have been purchasing and, mm -hmm. and collecting uh, the NFT. So now you'll be able to actually go and connect together this sort of hybrids into, you know, the, the metaverse, these spaces that people are looking to be a part of. Um, and so it's allowing fans, you know, Navak Collective is basically saying, come in, we're creating these worlds, you can be neurodivergent, you can be what, whatever, you, literally metaverse literally means show up however you are, right? Yeah. Like who you want to be, not who you are, but who you want to be, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, it's just fun to watch them go through this, but the, but the foundation is the belief in the hum, human being mm -hmm. and making sure that they're better, they're doing well, and then you apply that next level of musicality to it. And they're writing with people who have written with like Gnarls Barkley and other major art, Justin Bieber, you know, these are people who are very high up in the industry yeah. helping to produce their music. So it's got an incredible sense of pop to it or singer songwriter talent that's just like out the door. So um, yeah, it's been really fun to watch them and be a part of it. But I'd say, you know, why I feel so strongly about them is in the face again of all the adversity of the hype cycles in the market, mm -hmm. they maintain a Web3 focused presence. Obviously they have things on Web2, they've got everything on Spotify and her numbers are great, all of them. In fact, Rosa Lynn, her, she co-wrote a song in a writer's camp that I can't remember what it was. I'm blanking on the name of the song, but it, the publishing alone is what's fueling their foundation. So, you know, these artists talk about a smart contract. Yeah. Part of their work is that they allow artists to say, I'd like to give back a percentage of what I'm earning to the foundation. Mm -hmm. So that's sustainable. Like it just becomes, yeah, I, I really can't speak highly enough about them. I think they're doing a great job. The more I interview Alex and Tamar, the founder, founders, it's just like mind blowing the where this could go for their artists. Incredible. And yeah. you mentioned the metaverse. So what is the metaverse and what's the latest with how it's developing and evolving? 
Yeah, and that's a tricky one, right? It's like the metaverse is a space. It's like literally an environment that you build or artists, people build. Um, there's been so many, um, again, hype cycle. Metaverse started in Snow Crash was a, a book that was written, I don't know, 20, 35 years, 40 years ago, something like that, 35 years ago. And they took the term metaverse from this book. And then there's a company called Second Life that in mm -hmm. 2003 started their process. By 2006, I was actually using Second Life at Kaiser Permanente for healthcare. It, they were literally using it to, to uh, develop knowledge to nursing. So you could actually go into Second Life, create a character, your avatar, and then you interact with nurses from all over the world, learning together in these spaces. That's genuinely what you're doing. You're just interacting together, you know, in a, a real time experience. So the most important thing is that you're, it's real time, right? So it's like, I'm here, you're here, and we're experiencing this together. Mm -hmm. That's the whole shared experience of the metaverse simplified. Yeah. Then there's next levels, which is like, you can actually own property. You can do things. There's company, there's a uh, platform called Decentraland. Um, there's Ro Roblox fits in certain pieces of it, not all because it's so gaming, but there's lots of ways to invite, you know, like create environments. Many of you have probably been on Fortnite. It's a game, but there's realms in that game, right? Yeah. So it's like all of these spaces could be considered alternate verses, mm -hmm. which, you know, gets to a metaverse. Um, I would say Decentraland is probably the most um, committed to this experience as far as music is concerned. They actually have a room established, it's a, the studio, um, and they have the Rock and Unicorn experience, which these um, this wonderful woman, Robin, she completely uh, engages so many people. And, you know, they throw concert series and um, festivals in the metaverse as well. So when you're doing something like that, it's obviously a bit more you know, it's like kind of what we went through in 2020 when everybody was learning how to do, you know, an OBS or like some kind of a stream. So you have to have a little bit of technical experience to do it. But there's people, there's a, a gentleman, a 76 year old man in Second Life, uh, a blues artist who's making money doing blues shows in Second Life. And he's been doing it for years. So it's like there is a lot. This is uh, this um, when Meta decided to become Meta. I was like, that is the most inauthentic thing I've ever heard. There's yeah. no way this was going to last. And it didn't. It's just amazing because you can't just say you're meta. Mm -hmm. You have to like actually earn it. You have to create it and build it. And it's not just like, it's not the goggles that makes it a metaverse. That is a, a augmented, you know, visual VR component to it. But the real metaverses just exist in these spaces on your computer as well so you can do a lot in that without having to put any device on your face as well and i you know i'm not exactly sure where it's all going but the fact that it's been here before the hype cycle and there's still people working through it now i don't think it's going anywhere i just think it's like when you do pull the numbers back what was really a kind of just sort of like a weird moment was when you realize maybe at any given time, there's not a lot of people using it together. So that does make you question how much money you would spend in developing it. But if you are you know, able to use environments, then like you can push your people to it. And instead of having to put the visual goggles on, they're just like in the central land, experiencing the music and watching in your avatars dance. And I mean, it is kind of a fun experience. I'm not gonna lie, like it's very fun. When we did the research on it, I think we did like meetups in like 10 or, so of these experience environments and you just learn a lot of like frankly how bad you are at left right turn mm -hmm. jump all of those things but more importantly i think it is a space where um you know when you when you do the research you realize that the neurodivergent audience of today is very much welcomed in that space mm -hmm. and you can literally do and be whoever you want to be you can be half lizard and half sword you, you can do whatever you want your characters can emulate anything and it feels very much like you don't have any barriers to being yourself. And that is the biggest draw of it. Definitely. That's amazing. So how are and how do you think artists will be able to work with and benefit from the metaverse? Well, the ones that I've seen doing it so far have been, you know, most of it's first to market, right? It's like mm -hmm. that always becomes a, oh, I'm the first person to do this. Or I'm like, I'm very cutting edge, but they can actually earn, you know, if you're, there's a company um, who does sinks in the metaverse as well. There's so many ways that you can earn money in that space if you're 
connected to it. But what I will say, this is probably the most critical thing for both Web3 and the metaverse. Um, it is not a cash grab. It is not a place to go and just expect to earn. You got to spend the time there. And if people feel like, especially in Web3, that you come in and you just want to earn and you don't want to spend time there, they will call you out on it. Um, they call it rugging or fudding and all sorts of interesting things. But most important is just like, don't do it if you're thinking it's going to earn you money. Right. Do it if you feel like your audience will benefit from it. Yeah. Again, the whole reason I'm doing these research projects for me is to understand what the consumer, what the audience, what the user feels like, yeah. what the fan feels like. In a metaverse experience, if you're going in to, to share your music, with a fan base that's already existing, they're gonna love it. There's not gonna be a problem. But if you think your fan base is gonna join you there, that's where it gets a little complicated. You have to do the work to make sure that you're part of the space. There are people who will guide you through it, like the woman from Rock and Unicorns. They're not alienating, they're very welcoming, but it's not just like a one and done thing. It's like they want you to be a part of it. It's yeah. a, you know, it's kind of like an, an another community. It is another community. Um, and again, in the Web3 space, they sniff it out really fast. So I would just say like, you know, the big artists that go in there, like Rick Ross did an NFT drop a couple months ago and it was very complicated, but he he got through it. You know, he was like, this is what I want to do. I want to have an NFT. I want it to be meaningful. I want to give away a piece of my jewelry. Like he wanted to be a part of it. So I think, you know, you can't, you can't, I can't underscore enough, make sure you're in it for the right reasons because the, the fan base in it already is is very um they're aware very aware of people coming into the space taking money from people and then disappearing yeah absolutely and like i said it's, it's how you use new technology this is a very imperfect example but maybe 10 years ago or so i was managing an artist and and twitter was kind of like the thing and he's like i tweeted i'm not big yet you know it's like how are you using the technology the technology is not necessarily going to do yeah. it for you and you know I was explaining the metaverse to my dad who was kind of cranky about it and I said look like you know it's what we were talking about before it's it's going to become ubiquitous where I'm like dad you'll like be at a Neil Young concert and maybe you never thought about like what a concert smelled like or kind of like bumping into someone or like I would like to go to a Tina Turner Turner concert or I would like to go to a Beatles concert or something so yeah the sky yeah. is really uh the limit on that yeah, there was something you just said that made me think, ah, oh, there was like, um, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to go away, but yeah. I think we have to think about the future. Right. So, right, when we look at things, when your dad and you were talking about it, mm -hmm. and when my friends and I talk about it, or our colleagues talk about it, you know, I often remind them, this isn't about us at all. It's, in fact, certainly not about me, right? It's about how do you find ways to make sure that if they're there, it's paid off, right? Like it's it's the future generations. Because if you think about, I, mean, I don't know if you have any, um, I have nephews, all of them play video games. Sure. You know, they call me and they're playing a video game. They're not even, their FaceTime is up at the thing and they're just like, hi, Auntie Kristen, I'm just gonna play my video game while we talk. That's a, a world that exists. And many, many people are already, millions of people are already doing that behavior. This isn't a layer over that because their comfort zone as a fan is to be engaged with a platform, right? So it's like, this is not right. difficult for them. They're not, they're like, they're looking for music in those games. They're looking for things in that. They're hearing it, they're picking it up. Their uh, brains are wired so differently than what we were about being with, you know, AM and FM dials or, you know, even the Spotify's, you know what I mean? Like I, most of them are just finding music and listening to music on the games. They're not going to Spotify. They're not going to Apple music to listen to things. Right. So, you know, we have to think about where do you, how do you meet fans where they are? And again, depending on your music, that might be an area you have to meet fans in. And this is one of the things to consider now so that you can start being like, am I that artist? Is this for me to do? And if so, how can I get there? And who's going to get me there? And what kind of companies exist to get my music in a sync for a metaverse concert or a metaverse? Uh, there's a, a they did a, a 
you know, New York Fashion Week kind of thing with, I mean, think about Balenciaga is in the metaverse. Major brands have stores in the metaverse and they're selling chains that unlock things and watches that do something or a hairband or, you know, face mask, whatever it is, a bodysuit. Why not have something associated? Like, it's like, this is there. And now people are going to it in these younger audiences. So we have to just figure out like, what, how do you meet them? Where are they? Yeah, is it? It's not like it's it's going to be huge, right now. Yeah, we're probably another twenty years away from it being huge. I mean, for what it's worth, it might not happen in our lifetime, but it is certainly something to think about because there are enough people in that space trying to figure it out now. That if the you know, if the world weren't in a VC you know down part, right, you know market right now, you'd probably hear a lot more about it because it still has a lot of rewarding benefits. And like I said, the benefits to the humanity piece, there are a lot of people who just don't feel comfortable being out and about. And this is a good place for them to be yeah. safe. So speaking of humanity, mm. uh, AI is a whole podcast in and of itself, more so than right. even a single oh, here episode. We go. So beyond destroying us all Terminator style, are there ways that AI can benefit artists now? Um, I, I personally love what Grimes is doing, for example. Yeah, well, she was, she's not the first one to do that. Mm -hmm. Actually, Holly Harridan was the first one to put her voice out. And yeah. we studied, we interviewed um, Dreams Never Die. So we did, in Water Music, we did, um, I was uh, able to help co-lead the last research project, season three on creative AI and music. And when like you interview um, Dreams Never Die and Holly Harridan's partner, they all, they worked together to take her voice. She had been studying this, her and her partner had been studying this for, I think it was like 10 years, seven years, something like that. And they were trying to figure out how to get her vocals, like Grimes did, give the vocal stems out, give the vocals out and let people do it. So over time they've created these sound files and literally put out her voice and said, here, now sing your song through my voice yeah. and that's exactly what grimes is doing and she's i'm so i mean it's fascinating watching people come out of the woodwork and they're just like i want to play with this i want to sound like grimes so and in her case you know 50 percent of what they put out if she you know she'll she'll earn from it um so that there is an attachment for financial benefit but it's more again even though holly did it first grimes got there because yeah. she was the first major you know artist of note to like do something with it. Uh, I do think that when I when we first started the AI uh, the, the project itself, I was very um, antagonistic. I guess is a nice word to say. Um, just felt like, what are we doing here? And how like is this a race to mediocrity or a race to the bottom? Right, especially as far as quality music is concerned. I now think that there are some things that if you're like the Grimes and Holly Harridan thing, it was the first thing I said, well, this this is an insight that if you are an independent artist and you actually have a very unique name or voice, uh, it's really not hard now, it was before, but now it's not hard for someone to literally make your voice into some form of an AI offering. Yeah. And, um, you know, about a year ago, I was like, one of my artists did stems Jessica Childress did stems for Lander mm -hmm. in her voice. She did a whole package, you know, plug, plug in package. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great to do the oohs and the ahs and the uh, and make it into her voice and then offer that? Because I had a feeling that was going to be the next phase of this, which I think will happen. But it's it's just taking your voice and making it into AI. That allows you to be more in control. You can get it in front of producers, in front of engineers, in front of right, you know, people and just have them use your vocal stems. So it is an interesting, that is one area that I think if you if you have the ability, maybe start looking into that because it is certainly could be where you sell your vocals as a package. And, you know, perhaps that's interesting to some artists and some producers. I think the other area that I immediately realized is the future is the prompter. So anyone who's ever touched ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly, any of the text to whatever, you realize how important prompting is. Prompting is probably, you know, as a manager, it would be interesting to find people who actually prompt in a certain way, you know, because it can also be really um, uh, unique to them, right? It's like their own, their own uh, way of getting 
just like you would hire a photographer to get a certain look or a graphic designer to get a certain look or an artist to get a certain look, you could now do that in AI and say like, I want it to sound this way. I want it to sound like I was using a, like a vintage mic from the seventies with a bass from the, you know, 1967, you know, and like have the sound file actually come out like you want it to. Right. So there that's the stuff that's coming. And there's rudimentary areas now that are working in that space. Many platforms are trying to, you know, work through that. Um, then there's the opposite of this spectrum, which is people who are not musically inclined, really, and never but always felt connected to it, but never felt like they were a music a musician. Right. So there's companies now that are doing things to just inspire creativity, which is a really big piece of what this is about. Right. Inspiration. So AI, you know, sounds very scary. There, There's a lot to unpack in that. I'm keeping it strictly on the music piece and I'm trying to find the opportunities because we all know there's a lot of rails that we need to be careful about. Um, ingestion, proprietary ingestion. Have I been trained.com? You should go there and check out and see if any of your artists have been used. I found out Hamish Anderson had been used in some things. You know, it's like if you want to rail your artist against it, it's very complicated to do that. Like sure. now, it, you know, chat GPT has been ingested up to 2001 and it stopped. Right. So 2002 and 2023 don't exist in those models, but chat, but GPT-4 has that. So it's like these are areas where if you're looking for lyric inspiration or ideas or if you're trying to, frankly, if you're just writing a caption for your Instagram or your TikTok or whatever, you can consult it. Like I always think of it like in my mind, what I'm using it for is um, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? You know, literally just like a little dialogue, you know, in with respect to creating music, that's a whole different ball game. Part of the AI work that we did also reviewed terms of all of these platforms. I highly recommend you take a look at that um, before you start ingesting anything into any AI model. Just make sure you know what their use is with it afterwards. And, oh gosh, you know, yeah. most of these companies are hip to the fact that you can't copyright anything unless it's proprietary. Mm -hmm. So many of them are actually creating their own sounds and putting it into their own ingestion systems. And that's how they know that they can create like boomy, you know, people have these files exist um, and then you're leveraging that. Yeah. So they'll own it, right? Because they created these proprietary pieces, but you'll be able to like some, in some cases, especially in boomy, actually create something on boomy I think they are at 12 or 13 million songs now, and they can actually put that into a DSP. Um, they have had a massive um, news cycle recently uh, because, you know, uh, and everybody's been, uh, I'm sure some of you have probably been on the copyright conversations um, around AI. Uh, and they're the ones, they're the first ones to say they're like basically going to market at a DSP. And so the DSPs suppressed their songs and then reestablish them because they weren't sure if they were actually, you know, just like, you know, helping the market. You know what I mean? Like already, what is a hundred thousand songs going to Spotify, going to the DSPs a day? Like you don't really need another million songs in there that are drivel, right? So I think it's there's a balancing act. So feeling creative on one side, really great and inspired um, within that environment. Same thing with the metaverse. Um, but I think as far as musicality is concerned, there are some that are better than others as far as like reasons why you would do this. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. It makes total sense, you know, and obviously there's a lot of concerns, you know, uh, um, around AI coming from artists, coming from people that support artists, you know, really in all fields. And, you know, can true artists ever be replaced? But I also want to reiterate again what we were talking about at the beginning of this episode and talking about with you, that fan experience, right? Like, sure, yeah, you could have AI sending your community.com direct to fan text messages, but this is why it's important, and you mentioned Taylor Swift, you know, to cultivate that community, cultivate that fan audience, right? Because you want them to be a fan of you, not, you know, a machine. 
Right. I mean, look, I, I, I deal mostly in, in black music, soul and blues, rock and roll, right? That's my favorite genre. And mm -hmm. I'll do anything in that space, most likely. Yeah. Um, one of the contemporaries of one of my artists, she's a very accomplished Jackie Venson, very accomplished guitarist, and she's doing really well. Today, she just dropped, or a couple days, maybe it was a couple days ago, but she, no, it was today. She dropped a Jackie by Robot, you know, Robot Jackie or something, or Automated. And it was like her way of just playing around with the AI stuff. I think if you're creative in general, it needs a human to be creative. Yeah. It just does. Right. It's like, if you're creative, this is just another tool, like a synth, like a, and like a, a MIDI player, you know, like a beatbox, like, you know, it's just another tool to use. It's not meant to be replacing humans. Mm -hmm. There are some jobs that will absolutely struggle. And I think that I can already tell you, I finished an online mastering research prog program uh, project. And I think online mastering might struggle for the future. You know, like it's a question mark, you know what I mean? Like what's the black box in mastering period? Yeah. That one might be vulnerable. You know, a human being absolutely brings touches to that, but can everybody afford it, right? Because, right. you know, mastering is very, very expensive. So there's certain DAWs that are going to already replace maybe some of the more, you know, rudimentary mastering experiences. Um, but I, other than that, I'd say there's like, you know, you still want a human to run an idea by, yeah. and I don't think that's going to change. I do think it is engaging, and I'm not going to lie, like I totally love that I got chat GPT to tell me that I had a good point the other night when I was talking about <laughs> yeah. subscriber-based models with it. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, you know, just don't rely on it. Let's yeah. put it that way. And don't go to market with something that you, you know, could question it's, uh, you know, your own ownership of it. 100%. So you're obviously live immersed in all this stuff, metaverse, AI, Web3. You live in a beautiful state, too. How do you find balance? Oh, wow. Did you just ask me? Yes. Oh, I mean, I, here's, I read a book called The Great Work of Your Life when I left my, my career in advertising, and I realized that music is my love. So I feel very lucky. Uh, it is a passion for me. I have been warned that I will hate music after working in it, but it's been over 10 years. I still don't hate it. Um, mm -hmm. So my balance is, frankly, sitting in space quietly, doing breathing exercises, and trying to find where I am in things. Because you're, you're right, like everything comes at us all the time. I don't have office hours that are normal. Um, I was joking with Jake before, uh, or Mike, I think it was, but I was like, this is my mother's sign when she was a therapist. I have it in my office. <laughs> Cause it's like, most of what I do is counseling yeah. and just, you know, trying for all of us to stay present, stay focused, uh, you know? And so for me, it's just a matter of like taking the, taking a beat, not having everything have to be reactive all the time. Yeah. And I love walking. I walk almost every day I take walks in Hollywood. I go see the crazy people out and everything. And it's just very humorous. I'll take a hike. Um, I do ride. I, I spend a lot of time with my sister. I, I just really, you know, enjoy my nephews and I'm very lucky to like, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm at a place now where I, you know, I know the value of some downtime and I need to prioritize that for me in order to be better for everybody else. So true. Um, yeah. Well, do you have time for some questions? I know I'm keeping you a little yeah. longer than what we promised. Oh, anything, sure. anything you want to add before we open it up to the audience? I mean, honestly, if anybody has any questions, this I blew through a lot of this very fast. This is the New York talker in me still. Um, so I'm open for any questions afterwards too. But I would just say like, have some fun with the stuff. And yeah. you know, really, if you could do anything, try and support an artist who's going through this just so you have your mm -hmm. own experience. And you can decide for yourself, you know, that's the best way to do it is just honestly get started, try it, get a wallet, see what it feels like and have some fun. And in the AI space, just be careful. Yeah. Why should we be careful? Oh, just don't up. put in, just don't, don't overuse it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's not, that's not going to be the relying, have original thought, you know, most important, be original because it, it, we're going to be in a mediocre, you're going to be able to tell what things were written by AI. You know what I mean? Like these are all you know, concise things coming, start making sure you're outside the box, you know, bring something to the table. I've got to say, I spoke at a university a few weeks ago 
And I got an email from a student who was applying for an internship, a student who was in that class, and I wrote back and I said, did you use AI to write this email? Wow. And because it, it was so obvious. And I wrote, I responded in a very non-judgmental way. So then he took it a step further. I got what felt like another AI response talking about how great it is for young people to use these tools. And I said, please talk to me like a human. You know, like yeah. it was very obvious that that first email was written by AI and really it didn't make any sense. And to me, it kind of, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, I talk to text a lot. But I always read it back before I press send. Have you ever gotten text where I'm like, what is this? Oh my God. And I got emails like that. that. Yeah. yeah you From get a sync like agent that. in New York. And I right. wrote back, I was like, I don't understand this at all. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No punctuation. I know that's like a thing by the past, but yeah. Totally. Just um, be original. No matter what, all of this will benefit you if you have original thinking. It's just try yeah. and not be everything everybody else is doing. It's so true. Great, well please introduce yourself in the mic and AMA. Uh, my name is Colin Dworski. I'm a music producer here in New York. Uh, I have a client who is, uh, he's so creative with the AI use. Mm -hmm. So he has a great following on TikTok. And my question is, so we, we produced a bit where he, he had his own verse, he's a rapper, he had his own verse and then did a verse and then we sent it to an AI producer, and the second verse was in, we he used Drake's voice, and then uploads mm -hmm. this up to TikTok, yeah. and it blows up, it does great, but mm -hmm. then I'm like, well, where, where, where's, where do you think the legislation's gonna head if he wants to make this an NFT, or some sort of digital thing where someone can own something that is using some of this other technology? Before I don't you answer, think can I just say that my attorney yeah. was going to come tonight and then she couldn't come? I'm almost so glad she's not here because her head would explode with that question. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can't go to NFT with that. I mean, yeah. it's just the, the community won't even allow for it, to be honest with you. Um, and I also think, again, coming back to it's like, the, I, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And I would I would really be very careful in that space. But you know, for what it's worth, no one gets sued right away. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people I know who are on a list of people who are going to eventually get sued. Yeah. It's up to you. I mean, you can make a name for yourself. It sounds like you've already done that job. I don't know why you. I would just double down on who that artist is as a person, like, or the producer. Like, I don't. It just feels to me like, what are you? What's the benefit to that artist? Yeah, and also. Um... Drake's huge, so they might not care, but um, they could take that to Drake's management and be like, hey, look at what we did. And I would think that a forward thinking, you know, artists and management would be like, cool, maybe we, w maybe you go in on an NFT together, you know, because yeah, that's, that's the main issue. You can absolutely is, pitch yeah. them. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I, would just, I would definitely say like, is, is Drake interested in getting involved in this? Yeah. He's probably not going to be wanting you right. to do an NFT. You know, there was an artist recent, uh, an NFT release recently with someone who owned one of Rihanna. She was, he was a producer of Rihanna's song. Uh, I think it was Umbrella. I think, um, or maybe it was Ponce to Replay. But anyway, basically, he put his per his portion of the song out as an uh, on the on chain to sell, right? As and and that eventually it got out. I was like looking at it, going, "How on earth is this legally possible?" I'm not exactly sure what happened with. It. I think it was taken down, but it is interesting because he owned a right of the song, so te technically he could sell his portion of it. So, yeah. I just think you need to be very careful. And again, just think about: it. is that going to help the artist? Yeah. Anyone else? I'm also happy. Yeah, come on up. I was going to say, I'm also happy to answer any of the kind of more, I was going to say traditional distro, now distro questions. But I also cover, we covered a lot of that um, in this episode in season two with CD Baby um, Chief Revenue Officer Christine Barnum. So I'm happy to answer that. But um, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tatiana. I just want to say thank you. I'm going to watch this like a million times over again. I feel like it's all the info is marinating, but I'm so thankful uh, for all the info. Um, so my question is like, I've been really having a lot of fun of on chat GPT, where it's kind of like replaced Google for me and also like Bard, which is like Google's version. And now on Discord and learning mid journey. Um, so I'm just wondering like if I want to use like my own likeness mm. to do like my own artwork 
then like how does that work with sort of like mixing the AI with like being able to use it or if I decide to make an NFT, it's like me, but it was made in mid journey. Like how am I able like if like can you combine web three with web two, I guess? Like if I'm like mm-hmm. I made this music video and then I wanna put it like on my other like avenues that I've grown and then I guess the other part of my question is like connectivity. Like if like I have my own NFTs and an- another artist has like their NFTs, like how do we like com- like combine our fans? Because I feel like my most growth has been with collaboration and partnerships. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know if my question. <laughs> yeah, it makes. Yeah, sense. I was gonna say. I'm, I I think that well. So the one question I heard was, can I use my own image, your own image and likeness in these platforms to create for yourself? And the answer is yes, you totally can, as long as you are you know own the image and like think about it through the lens of like a photographer. Just make sure that they allow the rights for something. Like if you, if the image, you know what I'm saying? Like whoever took yeah. that image, just make sure they're covered off on. Cause yeah. you know, from a copyright perspective, they might have some say over that. Um, but yeah, you should totally, and that's the whole point is like, have some fun with it on your, you know, like on you, <laughs> see what it feels like. Cause then it's safe, you know? Um, I'm not sure about the second aspect of that. Can you repeat that question? Um, so I guess my second, um, the other part of it was okay so now I've taken even if I took a picture on my iPhone and I put it in mid journey to make my own IP then I guess sort of like I want to give it to my fans to maybe make it like an NFT yeah right and give it to them as like oh this is an image or even if I made like a short animated video but then I'm like to for them to own it and then can I put it on web 2 and then if I if I start like getting income from it like Mm -hmm. but they own it like what does that mean and then also like if I have an NFT an NFT and then like one of my friends has an NFT how do we like sort of combine our sort of like connectivity between like our fans because it's just like we've always seen like that's the most growth for me is like doing like collaboration yes yeah okay so I'll so yes So the idea of you putting this out as an NFT and can you put it on other places? Yes, you can. Think about, like I said, this piece of art. If I make it into an NFT, the NFT is purchased. They don't own that art. That art's mine. That's the copyright right there. So that's how you look at it. This is just one aspect of it that they have purchased, just like if they would a print of it. So you have, and this is where smart contracts, like if you're going to do something like that, just make sure it's delineated because you're in charge, right? Like you get to set the terms. That's the whole point to this is you don't give away more than you have to give. Yeah. You just do it the way that it should be done, right? Where it's upfront, transparent, and everybody knows what's up. So you could say, look, if I, I, I want to sell my art, I want to sell my a video. I give. I want to give you a video. First of all, I do think if you have never done this before, start giving things first because, you know, unless your fans are ready to go and they have a wallet, they're going to need onboarding and onboarding when you have something that they could do for free, but it has a specific time period is a lot smarter for you to release with than if you say buy this and you only have a certain period of time because you don't even know if they have a wallet and they can do that behavior. So I feel very strongly try to give something first. And then I think the second part is like, you know, if you're going to go through all of that and say you find another person who's done some NFT experience as well, you could say if you're a holder of, right, that, like, if you're a holder of a water and music stream, or and you're a holder of Uncut Jewels, you know, NFT, then you can access this. So that's a way of drawing from those two audiences straight to your new thing. That's how you do that. That's a combined effort. And then they say, hey, what would we get in return? Oh, well, so this is like a special allow list that people who have these two areas, other tokens, can now access yours. It's an engagement strategy. That's what all of this is. So you're smart to think about it through the lens of combining efforts with someone. If you and that artist do a combined NFT, where you do the song file together or you do the art file together, and you both own that together, and that could be another thing where it's like to buy or grant be grant mint that NFT, you have to hold one of either one of your previous NFTs to do so. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. 
And I, I would add too, it kind of reminds me of like remix contests, right? Or having fans like do artwork and stuff. So like, could you have a smart contract that says that uh, you own the NFT 50-50 and the fan owns it 50-50? Could you do something like that? So I, this is where it gets to like, what's the, what is that ownership 50? I mean, yes, you can cut it any way you want, but then I think the question is like, how complicated of an experience do you really want this to be, sure. right? If they resell it, the point would be, yeah. do you get any money from that? Right. Right. Yeah. So, and also th think about it through the lens of like uh, a ticket to a community. Once you like the CryptoPunk community, if yeah. you purchase that CryptoPunk or you purchase whatever, you know, thing that you buy, Pudgy Penguin, whatever it is, or a Latasha music video, and you're part of the Discord because of it, you're part of that community because of it. Mm -hmm. If you sell that, you don't get to be part of the community anymore. The person right. who owns it does. So this is where yeah. it's unlocking something very, very specific, and it's exclusive to you when you own it, mm -hmm. not afterwards. Yeah, because I, I was thinking about the any sort of co-ownership or something you could build into a smart smart contract where you could bring it back into Web 2.0, and then same with collaborating your friend when you're saying like, well, we have two NFTs, can we combine them? You know? Yeah, yeah. But the sky's yeah, the limit. Yeah, like I said. Yeah. Go ahead. There's a lot of ways to do it. I just think when you're thinking about it, think think through the engagement lens, right? The, how you would engage a fan base of another artist. Yes. And it's the same way. It's like, we'll do a show together. We'll do a, a remix together. You know what I mean? We'll get in the studio together. There's lots of different ways you can do it. When you're working through that, there will be obvious pitfalls on any resale component because that's where both of yeah. you will be. It's just like a song. It's like you don't want to sell it and then have it taken away from you later. So you have to be really careful. Just make sure that it's sort of like a, a likeness, but not the piece. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh my God, thank you. I could not find this on the internet anywhere, like an answer for this, but I, I'm, I'm so thankful for this. And I think mostly it's really just a lot of fun at this point. Mm -hmm. And But it's also as an artist, yeah. I want to feel like, but I don't want to do the wrong thing and then happen what happened to previous generations where they did the wrong things and it was bad for them so but anyway thank you so yeah. much i think this is all about experimenting and i can't yeah. wait to see and hear what Absolutely. you do <laughs> thank you so much get on up there yeah. i think that's like my favorite word about this is experimentation mm -hmm. but small small right iterative yeah. think innovation when you're dealing with innovation you don't go out with your full formed thing you go out with an alpha friends and family angel you go out with a beta you test the heck out of it right then you go out with the launch so it's soft launch to the hard launch mm -hmm. i don't think this is any different test get a sense see what happens see who comes to the table work with them figure out what that looks like find other artists who are in the space there are tons of people in this space doing amazing things open up twitter take a look and see who's out there and listen first listen and learn contribute gift then you get incredible hi um my name is taurus and i'm with 333 music llc we have our own indie label um nice. it's been about six years that we've been doing this but we were releasing music uh way before that without a company so mm -hmm. we were just putting stuff on the streaming services and releasing things and having things you know the the, the money going into our own personal accounts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But now we're, we're all established and we just got to the point to where we start to understand how to navigate this social media and streaming, uh, marketing music and everything. And now everything is different. So my <laughs> question is, do you think it's smart to start to go back through our old catalog of music and create NFTs from that stuff and start promoting mm -hmm. that in a new way because we have so much catalog. We have like four or five albums of different things that we released in different genres that did pretty well, but we look at that like, wow, maybe we can go, instead of just constantly creating new things, we can go through our old catalog and create new content for NFTs and for the metaverse and stuff like that. What do you think about doing something like that or do you think it's probably a waste of time? I know that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, when I first started researching the Web3, that was the first thought I had, is I should just have all of my artists go back catalog, 
put everything out as an NFT and allow it to live there and see who buys it. Yeah. It's a terrible idea. Okay. It's terrible. I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> but here's why. Build the space first. Yeah. So if you go out there as the label and you shine light on your artists and you hold space, you hold Twitter spaces. I don't know if you've done all of that. Have you done that work? Yeah, yeah. It's minor, but not, not majorly. Okay, so you've already done that. Yeah. So then I think, yeah, if you've established yourself, then you can go back and be like, oh, th like not all at once, but like one at a time, yeah. and release it yeah. with a strategy yeah. that's actually about, here's what I think, posterity, right? Preservation, provenance. Those are literally the new three Ps in my mind. It's like, you know it's gonna be there for forever. It's yeah. posterity, right? And you know that the provenance can be established, the ownership, right? Yeah. So it's like, at this point, it's just a matter of like, how do you get them? Like, what's the, what does the market allow for, for the money, right? right? That piece should be the last part because for what it's worth, do something innovative with that sound file or that NFT piece that then unlocks something else for them to want to be a part of that journey with you. So it's not just about releasing the asset and asking them to either mint or buy or whatever. It's about what does it do more? How does they how do you get them back continually back in your ecosystem? Right. So before you do any of that back catalog, I would just say what are you creating and how does it fit into that cycle, right? So if you're saying once a month I'm gonna do a rare find, like that's how you can word that kind of stuff where it's yeah, like yeah. very much about scarcity, not about having everything on chain just for, you know? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and, and I think this that whole thought process came from, uh, we've been doing a lot of talk about legacy mm -hmm. and once About you which one? A, a lot about legacy. Oh so, yeah, 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 yeah so, for sure. So That's all I think about. Once you start getting into that, you're, you you start to think about well, how can we make these things last longer than us? You know, how can we have exactly these things provenance go and, further and further? ownership? So mm -hmm. That's um, how the whole conversation mm -hmm. came up, and then you know we we just we thought of that idea. But I'm so glad that we didn't start trying to do this. <laughs> I've been talking to a lot of people about it, but I think that's the best answer. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, and, I, and I, what I mean is it's not a, it's a terrible idea to just throw it up there. Yeah. It's a really good idea to go back and offer fans their like something very important, which like one of my artists has had a vinyl out of print for seven years. It was their debut album. And as part of the pre-order, I said, if anybody has a wallet, let me know and we will do something special for you. Out of all of the, I mean, it's a soul band, right? So out of all of the fans that bought, you know, hundreds of the, the, of the vinyl, there was only one person who had a wallet. So wow. I wanted to be able to give him something very special and we're working through an actually one of one for that. But I think the point is more like, make sure you know your audience. Are they there? Can they help? And if you do have an audience, start finding ways to bring your back catalog meaningfully front. Oh, also, if you look at, um, I'm sure you probably have heard this stat, but the last few years, you know, they're, they're realizing the importance of the back catalog, which really only means 18 months or older, right? Oh, so yeah. back catalogs used to, in my mind, was like something from the 80s or the 90s, you know what I mean? Now it's like, right. if you're an 18-month-old song, it's a back catalog. It's considered, you know, wow. something that is a catalog. Yeah. So you could also just be like, you know, deep cuts, like just have some fun with why you're doing it, but make it meaningful. Don't just put the song up, make it meaningful and be like, this is one of four, or your exclusive mint, you know, have that scarcity piece be a part of it and just yeah. don't throw it all up because that it's not going to, that's not going to move the needle. It's going to be more like, what's the meaning behind it? Yeah. And just to make a quick statement. Um, so I, I love that you said that because we did something recently where we had a five song EP of these songs that we used to perform live, but we never recorded them. We thought mm. to record them, then we did it and put them on CDs and sold a hundred of them for like five dollars a piece, and that's it. So once we did it, we autographed them and did all this stuff, and we just thought that's how that's where music is going. It's not. It, we would love to sell a million copies of something, but now it's about your core fans and doing something special that yeah. you would never get that kind of money from from streaming. So no. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about like your hundred true fans, right? Or a thousand true yeah. fans. Yeah. And I mean, you know, many people have thoughts on that. I personally feel like you can't expect 
fans, like, let's put it this way, like we can't all support everybody's career, right? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna think about it, like you might buy an NFT from like 10 different artists or 20 different artists, but there's only one that you're gonna be like, every single time they do it, I'm gonna do something. Yeah, you know? yeah. So just consider that like, that idea of scarcity, that idea of what you mean to those fans, like it really is um, thoughtfulness, like in and, 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 and the new community and a way to identify these people. And frankly, the, the legacy piece is like, in five years or whatever, you can still be able to say like, we were part of a unique experience and like, here we are doing more, right? Then you can identify them. And I think there's a lot more tools coming. You know, this I'm hoping for what it's worth, that this is shedding light on some of the DSPs that they're really holding hostage the relationship between the artist and the fan. Yeah, and that is true. uncool and unkind. I know Spotify just opened up a DM thing. Um, I'm, I have said for many years, I don't know why Spotify stopped that process because it used to be you could connect with each other. This is, it's terrible that that happens. We build, yeah. as musicians, we're in representation of musicians, we're building out entire platforms and technology that are on the back of the artist. So I'm like, no, absolutely not. They should let us talk to our fans. And that's what this is about. So I feel very strongly about that dialogue just being like a complete, you know, hostage situation that is unnecessary. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's like exactly yeah, what this episode is all about. That's what we talked about at the beginning with direct to fan, right? I know this is like the third time I've said it, but instead of just popping your Spotify link up and giving me fractions of a penny, right. it's direct to fan, right. direct to fan. So whether I'm talking about like your website or Bandcamp or what Kristen's talking about, it's all the same. Create great art, take care of your fans a very close second. Yeah, and you can't expect everybody to be there all the time, so don't get salty if they can't. <laughs> it's okay. Awesome. Well, unless I, I think we're good. I think that was a lot of information. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge and your passion My and pleasure. your wisdom. This was incredible. <laughs> it was great to meet you like this. I appreciate it. In our own little Tower Labs metaverse here. Yeah, I, can't, I really am so jealous. I can't even tell you. Well, you can check it out next time you're here. I'm coming. I'm coming. Amazing. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you, Emily, for having me. I really appreciate it. It was really, really fun. Yeah, my pleasure. So that's a wrap for episode six of season three of how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams, which means we're halfway through taking you through the entire modern music industry, making sure you're not missing any uh, revenue streams along the way as well. Join us on Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern in real life here at Tower Labs in Brooklyn or via live, live stream on our YouTube as we discuss how to market with or without a budget with Junae Brown, founder and CEO of Brown to Perfection Agency, who is also known as the Beyonce of marketing. Super excited for that conversation. Thanks so much to podcast manager Michael Zimmerlich, engineer Nathan Kane, Matthew Wong for, compo yesterday's guest, Matthew Wong for composing the show's music, Danny, David, and Jake at Tower Records, the Ally Coalition, Liquid Death, Hal Leonard, and of course, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment's New York Music Month for making this all happen. We'll see you Monday.